This is Sergio Vega from Quicksand, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with a brand new episode. And in the guest host chair today, I've got returning guest, Jeffrey Smith of Jerome's Dream. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be back. It's great to have you back, Jeff. You know, right before we recorded, we were talking and we were trying to figure out exactly when you were on the show last. I think it was 2021, right? Yeah, it's... uh... It's a blur. Life in a pandemic, I, although most people act like we're not in one, and I may be one of those people too. But but yeah, I mean, it, it seems like just yesterday. It, it may be because I listen to you all the time, so it feels like I'm with you a lot. <laughs> so you actually listen to the show all the time? I do. I listen to it very often. Not every week, but I, I definitely pull out some of the, some of the episodes. That uh, that still blows my mind, especially when people who are in bands that I listen to tell me that. Well, I mean, you do a good job. It's a, it's, you're you're really funny, and you ask really good questions, and you have a very pleasant voice, so it helps me to to listen to it. Oh well, thank you. I see. I love this part of the show where we talk about my good qualities. We, <laughs> I could do this all night, but listen, Jeff, we can't because we've got a major major show for the people. We've got you here, and we've got our interview subject, Kurt Ballou of Converge. I I mean, mean, come on. Heavy hitter right there. I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's really great to, to listen to Kurt after all these years. I mean, I haven't talked to him in, I don't know, 20, 20 years or so, maybe a little more. And, you know, it it feel, again, it feels like yesterday just hearing, hearing his voice. So, so thanks for having me on for this for this episode. I'm really excited about it. I'm excited too. Did he record Jerome's Dream? He did. He recorded uh, Seeing Means More Than Safety. He recorded the Orchid Split. That was actually the same session. He recorded the split with 1AM Radio and he recorded Presents. Wow. Yeah. All the good stuff. <laughs> or at least back then. <laughs> That's awesome. You're going to hear it all from Kurt. We cover the whole history of God City Studios in all of its various locations. We talk about the pedals he's building. And of course, we talk about Converge. There's a lot of Converge talk, Jane Doe talk. I pitched a Converge Classics tour to Kurt, where I had the great idea that they play some older stuff on tour, like the first three albums. And uh, hang on to the edge of your seats to hear Kurt's response to that. (laughs) I I think you can imagine what he said. (laughs) But it's listen, this is one of the longest interviews I've ever done. And I'm so happy that it was with Kurt because I've been waiting to talk to somebody from Converge since I started this podcast. Wow. That's why you started the podcast. I I started this as a Converge-based podcast. And All right, I'm lying, but listen. (laughs) It's a great conversation, and it's coming up shortly, and you're going to love it. But first, here's how you can support us, the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Reviews. Have you left a review for the show yet? Give us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Did you know that you can write a review on Apple Podcasts? And Jeff, I've got a new review here in Apple Podcasts. I'm going to read it right now. This one is interesting. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Five stars from Cam Ciola. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Amazing guests, interesting conversations. I will, guaranteed, Interrupt whatever podcast I'm listening to when a new New Scene episode drops. Love the variety of guests Keith has on the show. Always fun hearing people from bands up and down the heavy music community spectrum give color to their music, their musical upbringing, and other things that impact their art. One day, I will get to be interviewed by Keith, seeing as everyone else from my band has been on various episodes. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Kem, for that very nice review. Get in touch with me, new scene pod at iodinerecords.com or through the Instagram. I'm, I, want, I need to know who you are. Let's talk. That's high praise. I mean, that's a great review. I'd be really stoked to, to hear that. Yeah, my favorite part of the review is when 
he stops whatever other podcast he's listening to to listen to me. I I like that. That's a that that's good. Everyone should do that. I was nodding in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> No, but that's I listen, I'm being uh I'm being facetious, but that's a really nice review. So thank you, Kem, for submitting that. And I look forward to talking to you more. And don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. There were wires. The self-titled debut LP is being repressed on vinyl and it will be available soon. And speaking of Converge, the record has been completely remixed by Kurt Ballou at God City Studios. And it includes several out of print B sides and the band's demo. We got to get our hands on this. Great band, right, Jeff? Definitely. And you know, it, it's funny. You mentioned uh, that it was remastered and uh, remixed and remastered. One of those or both. I don't even know the difference. Right. <laughs> well, either way, Kurt is talking about how he how he takes care of old friends, and I feel like this they fall into the old friends camp. All right, so in addition to the new There Were Wires LP, the second pressing of Quicksand's Slip is now up for sale. And you got to get it fast before it's gone. It's going to go. It's Slip, for goodness sake. Slip, Jeff. Slip. That record is one of the first records that got me into this kind of music. I I used to drive around with my my friend and... You know, he'd play all this this different stuff. He was older than me. I think he was like 25 or so when I was 18. And he would just play all this different music for me. And one day he, he said, here, take a listen to this. And it was Slip. And I was like, oh, my God, what is this? Because it was completely different than all the other stuff that he'd be playing. You know, he's playing, I don't know, Gorilla Biscuits or whatever. And I didn't know about the the connection yet. Slip still stands on its own as an all-time classic. Nothing quite sounds like it. It's fantastic. I mean, Casey asked me to write a little blurb for it. And, you know, I went and I listened to the the record in, in its entirety before I wrote the blurb. And it just brought back so many memories. I was like, oh, this is so good. And it really stands up. So, yeah, um, I, I highly recommend getting a copy before they're gone. You have to. You have to. Sign up for the Iodine email list. You'll be the first to find out about all these releases and represses and everything else. For more information, head to iodinerecordings.com or the Iodine Instagram at Iodine Recordings. Also, don't forget to support this month's sponsor. Jeff, I'm going to give you one guess. Can you guess who this month's sponsor is uh i'm gonna say clorox that's right clorox disinfect no i'm just kidding (laughs) it's bridge nine records that's right bridge nine records will be sponsoring this month of shows once again and we love bridge nine records jeff when you think bridge nine records what's the first thing you think of aren't they from the uk no they're from boston oh Legendary hardcore label from Boston, American oh. Nightmare, oh. Newfound Glory, okay. Hope Conspiracy. See, that's yeah. that's that's a different that's a different world for me. I never really got into that that Boston scene in that way. Well, now's the perfect time, Jeff, because you can get fifteen percent off any Bridge Nine order with the code New Scene Pod. That's right, fifteen percent off any order by entering the code New Scene Pod at checkout and jeff you can get your hands on all of the bridge nine classics american nightmare hope conspiracy newfound glory you name it everybody who's anybody has been on bridge nine yeah i feel like my friend used to play in this band and i always forget what they're called and i bet you they were on that label too jeff is going to remember the name of the band and i'm going to talk more about Bridge Nine. Don't forget to stop by the record store at 282 Rantoul Street in Beverly, Massachusetts. It's open every Wednesday through Sunday, starting at 11 a.m. And Bridge Nine is doing record auctions. Don't forget to follow that account on Instagram at B9 Auctions. For more information, head to the Bridge Nine website at bridge9.com. That's bridge the number nine.com or the Bridge Nine Instagram at bridge nine. That's Bridge N-I-N-E. Okay. So, Jeff. Yeah. Now we need to talk about music recommendations. What are we listening to? It can be new. It can be old. It can be heavy. It can be not be heavy. It doesn't matter what it is. I need to know what you're listening to right now. I got a handful of bands that I've been listening to 
pretty regularly over the last few months. Um, the new Spotlights record came out or EP. I've been enjoying that. Oh, yes. It's really good. Um, you should get them on uh, if you don't already have them scheduled. Um, I've had uh, Chris Enriquez on the show. And uh, listen, we're going to be talking about this later, but I have some tour dates coming up with Spotlights in Florida. We're, we're going to get to that, though. I don't want to ruin Jeff's flow here. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, chat, the new chat pile. Really, really good. I'm, into, I'm really into the band Dry Cleaning, if you've heard them. Um, they're from the UK. The, the singer writes the, the best lyrics. Meat Wave. Not sure if you're into Meat Wave, but um, really great band from Chicago. Uh, another really great band from Chicago called Fax. Um, their new record's coming out pretty soon. And Eric actually interviewed the singer, guitar player, on his podcast recently. And uh, of course, Metz. Metz is also in heavy rotation over here. So I mentioned before we started recording, I've been moving. So I've got all this stuff that's kind of, you know, got a lot of energy so I can, I can do all the, all the moving and uh, building of furniture, et cetera, et cetera. So it's exhausting, right? It's exhausting. Don't do it. Don't ever do it. (laughs) I'm not, I've been, I'm going to stay in this place as long as I can. Believe me. I was talking to Jeff earlier. He said he had been in his apartment for 18 years, which is unheard of in the city of San Francisco. But listen, there comes a time where everybody has to move. That's true. I thought I'd die there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't, Jeff. Yeah, me too. I haven't heard most of those bands, but listen, I'm going to have to. And my recommendation for this week is Can't Swim. The album is Thanks But No Thanks. I've been listening to it nonstop. The thing happened where I hear a brand new band and I get grabbed by it and I listen to a certain song one million times, but now I'm listening to the whole record. It's really good. It's like emo-ish with a tinge of pop punk. It's really upbeat music. You know, it's getting warmer out. It's getting brighter out. And this album is the perfect soundtrack to that. So make sure you check it out. I'll add a song to the new scene, 2023 Spotify playlist. Okay, so listen. Check back in with me and Jeff in segment three. We're going to talk to Jeff because I need to find out what's going on with him. We need to talk about the upcoming brand new Jerome's Dream LP, The Gray In Between. We're going to cover all of that. We're going to dive into it. But right now, we are going to speak to Kurt Ballou of Converge. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Kurt Ballou. Kurt, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Kurt, I'm very excited to have you here. You know, you've done a lot over the years, Converge, God City Studios, everything. You've done it all. And Kurt, we're going to cover all that. But first, let me ask you, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. I've just uh, been busy in my studio mixing a record. What are you working on right now? Um, a little rock and roll band. You know, I, 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 I don't like to talk about the projects I'm working on um, until they're out, just because I don't know what the, um, you know, what the promotion strategy is for my various clients. So, like, I don't know if stuff's a secret or if stuff's public or what they want to do. So, um, I don't like to name names while I'm in the process. Oh, no, that makes sense. You know, like, I don't like to give away my whole guest list. You know, I want, yeah. it, to, I want it to be a surprise week to week. No, I got in trouble one time where I was like recording a band and I made some sort of post that, you know, mentioned their band name and they're like, great, it's a secret. <laughs> and, uh, and ever since then, I've just been like, you know, I'm just, just not going to say anything unless, um, you know, unless someone says it's like, it's, it's cool to go and talk about it. That's the way to do it. Did you have to delete the post or edit it? Yeah, I think, um, we somehow like rolled it into the, uh, the shtick of the promotion of the record, I think. <laughs> so how booked out are you typically for your studio, God City Studios? Um, usually four or five months out. Um, that's where I like to be. Um, but this year's been especially busy. A lot of um, this is such a strange time, kind of in the you know with the pandemic and all. Like the work that I've had has varied a lot over the past couple of years. I've had some some a few droughts and a few like real real wet seasons. You know, like last summer, for example. Uh, every single band in the world was on tour and therefore those bands weren't really recording so much. You know, a lot of bands made records of different types during, during quarantine. And then once they, once it was a little more um, open to touring, I think they were all out promoting those records. So, you know, touring was like super, super competitive last summer. You know, there was, 
we had a hard time finding finding vehicles um you know i heard about bus companies who had waiting lists 40 or 50 bands deep Whoa. for vehicles people were canceling shows and tours we had to cancel some shows and you know so that during that whole time period when everyone was busy um busy playing shows there wasn't oh, as much recording going on but th that has uh things are a little bit more back to normal now and at the moment i'm booked into november uh we're recording this at the end of february um so that that's that's really far out and i i actually don't like to be booked that far out in advance because i feel like it's really hard for people to plan musicians especially it's hard to plan that far in advance you know like it's really easy to think and you know when it's february it's really easy to think that in november you're going to have 10 songs ready to go but like the reality of it is like you know you might be ready in july or you might be it might be a year and a half before you're ready and you really don't know so to try to plan stuff that far out is um is difficult and i find that like four or five months is usually the sweet spot um between like you know getting a band to come in with their material when it's still like fresh and exciting to them but also you know still has enough enough time where they're like you know really well rehearsed and and solid and and you know we can make a good plan or you know something something happens and the schedule needs to be adjusted there's still like a little bit of room to to compensate and make adjustments and you know I, I I have allowed myself to get booked that far out in advance this year just because it's a bunch of like old friends slash old clients that are kind of coming back around and making records and you know a lot of a lot of my job is just getting it's kind of it's weird like I, I've got a lot of these like acquaintances and and friendships and extended family all over the world and I get to see them like every few years or every. 10 years even like when they when they make a record and uh, so it's like a when i have the opportunity to like get together with like the people that i care about and, and make music with them um i really i'll allow myself to get booked a little further in, in advance but it's been a bit frustrating um because there's a lot of you know new new clients new bands that want to come in here and, and do stuff with me and i want to be able to to help them I, I like i like being able to work on a lot of projects like i, I like shorter term projects so i can like get my fingers in a lot of stuff and hang out with a lot of people and you know be be helpful to a lot of projects um and i've had to turn a lot of things down this year um which is you know that makes me sad but you know a good good problem to have it is a good problem to have that is what i was going to ask you if you have to turn a lot of stuff down like can anybody record with you like uh, i'm starting a band could i conceivably record with you but maybe it won't get booked until 2024 yes i don't i don't have any rules about like um like you have to be signed or blah 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 like but it's not first come first serve so right. like i will look at what i have going on and you know, so first priority will be my band anything we're doing like right re writing recording touring you know or actually first priority is my family second priority is my band you know third priority would be what's going on with like my old friends and my existing clients and you know if i have time after that then yeah i'd, I'd love to do other projects but like i'm not going to book something two years in advance with a stranger because it's very possible that my band could need to tour that month or something like that you know so that's that's another reason why i like to book maybe four or so months in advance because then i have a good idea as to what amount of time i'll have in between other projects and like you know the main criteria for me in choosing what i do is like do i like it do i think i can and do i think i can contribute to it so like i like to be useful and i like basically i like to enjoy my day so you know enjoying my day means working on music that i find interesting and with people that i like to be around and also like things that i can contribute to so like if there's um you know like a, a player who's playing a part that's above their ability level and they're insistent on trying to do it and it just takes take after take after take after take after take that's fine um but i start to feel like well there's other there's other projects that i'd like to be working on where i where the my whole time can be used productively mm -hmm. versus like me babysitting pro tools or a tape machine while someone um struggles to play their part that doesn't feel like a great use of my time so right. i try to avoid projects like that or i try to delegate um times on a project like that to other people how many people work out of your studio with you uh at the moment just two uh, me and zach weeks 
So Zach's my staff engineer. He also has um, a space upstairs above the studio that he does. Um, he can do overdubs up there and editing and um, and mixing up there as well. How does the and structure also, work? Are they like employees of you in the studio or do they get yeah. paid directly from the artists they work with? How does that all work out? Um, he's, he's freelance. So, um, he, um, you know, I, I, I hire him when I need his assistance on projects. Mm -hmm. Um, if he's working on a project that is, um, that I'm not involved in at all, then he pays me, uh, for the studio time. And, um, we basically have kind of like a barter system. So not a ton of money changes hands. But he has access to um, to this facility to do his own work that he that he chases down. It's got to be great that you have your own self sustaining thing here. That you know you make the schedule, you decide who you want to work with. I mean, that's the dream, right? Yeah, yeah, it's great. I'm happy. I'm really thankful that you know I've been able to earn a living in music for so for so long. Right, and you have been doing it a long time. So let's take it back a bit. I'm curious about your early days in music i know you got started playing in the school band you used to play several instruments doing that right like what grade were you in school band um i started in fourth grade so i would have been 10 years old and why did you start did you were was it something you were interested in was it just one of the classes like what was the story uh i'm not really sure it just sort of seemed like that was the thing you did like um you know just like you join cub scouts and you join you know you you join school band it was just another or you and you start playing soccer and things like that um it was just like an activity that was available for kids that i think my parents probably encouraged me to do it um most i would say most of my classmates did play an instrument in fourth grade and you know probably 50 percent of them stopped by the time we got to sixth grade and you know slowly but surely more and more people dropped off while you know the people who had you know a real interest in or and or aptitude for it for it hung around um and yeah it just sort of snowballed from there when did it become a major focus for you playing music playing in bands that type of thing um i think it was a slow evolution you know it was one of it was one of the first things that i felt good at in my life you know i wasn't like a born athlete and I was you know, pretty, pretty decent academically, but I wasn't like an academic superstar, but, um, I think I, I think I derived a lot of, uh, sense of sense of self-esteem from being good at something. Maybe prior to that, I was, I was like, I excelled at, at like BMX stuff and you know, I used to race BMX and, you know, I'd, I'd win trophies and stuff doing that. So like that, that was a source of self-esteem. And then I think as I got older, my focus shifted a bit towards music and that became, you know, it sort of started defining who, who I was and, and defining my social circles in school. And then things, things really started to change when I, maybe first when I started playing a bit of piano, but, but certainly a lot more so when I started playing guitar because guitar marked a very distinct shift between playing other people's music and writing my own music. I mean, I did do some writing prior to picking up the guitar, but like once I picked up the guitar, like writing was really the focus. And so that it became a lot more expressive at that point. And therefore, like I, I threw more of myself into it and it felt like more me. Yeah, I've heard you say that, you know, you really learned to play well, one by, you know, listening to Metallica and Slayer and learning that by ear, but also by writing your own songs and kind of writing outside of your comfort zone. And that forced you to get better. And I really could relate to that because that's how I learned to play, just writing songs. You know, a lot of them never went anywhere and not a lot of them didn't end up in bands, but I would just write a lot of my own stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of guests on this show, a lot of people you know have credited you with really building up the local scene in Massachusetts, you know, recording bands, starting bands, getting people playing, all of that stuff. But I'm interested, Kurt, in how you discovered the whole thing. Like, what was your entry point? What band did you see? Did you discover a venue? Like, how how did you stumble onto this whole thing? Like, onto punk rock? Yeah. Oh, well, um, you know, I think my story for that 
this, I think there's kind of two stories, right? There's the, the, the classic one that you hear a lot, which is through skateboarding. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, as a kid growing up in the eighties, you know, you know, we didn't have the internet. And so our, my window to the outside world was thrasher magazine. Well, first it was like a BMX action and BMX plus. So I had sort of this sort of vision of what this, you know, quote unquote, California lifestyle was. Um, and it was this far away magical place. Um, and then, I got started getting into skateboarding when I was maybe like, I don't know, like 11 or 12. And my, my focus shifted away from bikes more towards skateboarding for a little while. Um, and you know, I started reading Thrasher and, you know, I had so little media to consume as a kid that I would read Thrasher cover to cover, even the stuff that I didn't know about. And there was always music coverage in Thrasher. And I think a lot of that was because of um, Mike Gitter and Jake Phelps. And specifically because of those two who were from Marblehead, Massachusetts, there was always a bit of a a reference to music coming from Massachusetts, where I was from. So now this thing, this like magazine that offered a glimpse into what had been this far away culture was now starting to offer a glimpse into something happening locally to me. You know, there was not a ton of coverage, but a little bit of coverage about these like first wave second wave boston hardcore bands so like i started hearing about bands like um you know ssd and dys and um, jerry's kids uh, long before i had ever heard those bands I, and i even like I, like I knew what wrecking crew looked like before i had any idea what wrecking crew sounded like you know and then i also started getting skate videos and like back then like it was just contest videos but like people would um people would skate to music and it was always like, you know, misfits or Ramones or adolescents or whatever. Like, so I started hearing this stuff that way and I was watching for the skateboarding, but like the sounds are there. So the sounds are kind of seeping in. And, but then also like, I'm like a 12 year old boy at this point. So like anything that's like gross and taboo is like super fascinating to me. And so like, I'm reading we had these things. Do you remember these things called the truly tasteless joke books? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So like my friends would like some, somebody, it was almost like getting like dumpster porn or something. Someone would like get one of these joke books. I don't know how they got them like stole, from, stole from their uncle's sock drawer or something, but it's just yeah. like, you know, it's like a book full of like dead baby jokes and like cannibal stuff, jokes you know, and stuff. Yeah. Stupid, like stupid stuff like that. But we, you know, we're just like 12 year old boys sitting around in a room, like reading these, like, jokes and like giggling about them and and stuff and and then you know then somehow like one of my friends got a meet men tape and which you know to me at the time it was not performance art it was like it was like oh french people suck (laughs) like i'm taking that at face value um (laughs) you know and then like you know and then later there was like this the first suicidal record came along and you know i saw your mommy and your mommy's dead like to me that's just that was like I was like, oh, dead mom. Like, you know, it's just like stupid 12 year old boy shit. So, like, I started like listening to that punk stuff more like for the comedy or, or even actually, I heard, I heard Megadeth covering anarchy in the UK before I ever heard Sex Pistols. Uh, but that whole like, you know, anarchy, destruction, like all that stuff was like appealing to me as like, a, you know, a 12 year old kid with like, you know, testosterone boiling over in his system anything that was like left to center and and like um anything that would gross out my parents like i was i was i was in and you know so i think i started getting into punk that way and then um you know eventually you know picked up a guitar and and punk stuff was like obviously like a little bit lower point of entry than like the van halen or led zeppelin that i had been listening to at the time so I started playing like local Boston hardcore covers and or like New York hardcore covers or like classic hardcore songs. Like, you know, like when I eventually joined Converge, like we were called Blindside at the time, like the first show we played was like all covers. And I remember doing like Minor Threat, Slapshot, Suicidal, um, this local Boston band, Eye for an Eye. Um, i trying to think what else. Maybe uh, Iron Cross songs. Um yeah, we did, you know, we did all kinds of stuff and, uh, yeah, so that, that, you know, it's like a, and and then through playing that music, um, I started to listen to it more and just got more engaged in it. Um, the first show that I ever went to is like DIY show in the basement of a church. It was, um, 
Sam Black, a band called Sam Black Church. And uh, I can't remember who else played, but yeah, I mean, there was a mosh pit and like, I was, I was hooked, you know, at one point the PA went out on this band. And so the singer just kind of like cupped his hands together and just started screaming at the crowd, like trying to scream over the band. And then the whole audience joined in to help him sing the lyrics. And um, it's definitely like not a sing along kind of band, but somehow they managed to do it. And I was, it was just like this amazing experience for me, for someone who's like live rock music experience at that point had been like seeing a Beatles cover band at my high school cafeteria (laughs) and you know stuff like that like it was like holy shit what is this like this is I gotta I gotta get into this now yeah I had the same experience you know I went to one hardcore show in someone's house like I I had been to two shows one was the first family values tour corn limp biscuit whoever else was on that ice cube and that's like a made orgy yeah and uh yes yeah they were actually really good at that but um that's like a big stadium show you know that's what that's what people are kind of used to then i went to a hardcore show in someone's house but my first real hardcore show experience middlesex new jersey 98 it you guys played converge it was dillinger escape plan a whole bunch of bands and i was terrified for my life and i was hooked on it ever since then yeah, that was uh that was a cool scene. We played that that room like maybe three times, three or four yeah. times. Yep. Yeah, everybody's played there. Yeah, it was like um on it seemed like every show there was, you know, what we would now call a fest. <laughs> exactly. Like a one day fest. Yeah. Eight to ten bands, you know. Yeah. So Converge starts as blindside. Um, when do when does it become converge? When do you get away from covers and start writing original material? as soon as i joined we started writing originals um like the guys who were in the band before me they they had a couple of they had been playing together for a while and they had a few different names and then like yeah i joined we started writing some originals and then you know again like i don't want i don't want to dwell on the no internet thing but like you know you can't just like google your band name to see if there's any other bands with your name right um so which i think is really i don't know if it couldn't have been intentional, but I think it's amazing that all the new metal bands with their like misspelled band names, like <laughs> I thought it was silly at the time, but now it's like, oh, these are all uniquely searchable. Um, yeah. So it's a, maybe just a happy accident. But anyway, um, so so we played as Blindsided for a little while and then like we kind of figured out that like, there was probably a few other bands called Blindsided and we should probably change it. So we changed it to Undertow and we recorded a demo as Undertow and um, pressed some tapes and, or maybe we just probably pressed the covers of the tapes of our demo, our first demo as Undertow. And then John LaCroix, who is like, he's been in a ton of bands, but he's, you know, I would say that 10 yard fight might be his best known band. Yes. Um, he, he called me up and he was like, Hey, I, I saw this zine from like Seattle and this artist band called undertow. And, you know, we're now like friends with that band. Um, and their singer, John, like has tour managed us before and stuff. But, um, but yes, we were like, Oh my God, what are we going to do? Can I change your band name? Like the tapes are being printed. <laughs> and so like Jake and I like pretty quickly came up with converge and, um, that just stuck. Now I think there's like a, maybe it's like a, a smaller K-pop band called Converge, but <laughs> and there's a, there's a, there's an internet service provider in like, I think like the Philippines called Converge. Um, so like our band account sometimes gets angry messages about like, uh, about like, you know, internet being out and stuff. Um, <laughs> Do you ever but, answer yeah. any of those emails just for fun? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't even, I don't even have the passwords to any of our socials, but like, I think Nate does that sometimes. Oh, so you don't even log into your socials? No. That's got to be nice to not even worry about that, right? When it comes to Converge, I just play guitar and record it. I'm not involved in really anything else. Um, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, we have a pretty good division of labor within the band. Like, you know, Jake obviously does art and record label stuff. And, you know, Nate and Ben do a lot of other logistical things and travel stuff and, um, you know, socials and so forth and so on. I like that. That's the. I think that's the way it works out best. Like everyone just does the thing they're best at. Yeah, I am not good at marketing. I I have absolutely <laughs> zero. It's the thing I have. Like I have like negative interest in that kind of stuff. You know, I have this like guitar company right now, and I don't. I don't like. I have no interest in promoting it. I just want to make. <laughs> I just want to make shit. I don't like want to. I don't want to sell shit. I just want to make shit. You have. I mean, you have to sell shit to keep making shit. But like, I could say shit, right? Oh yeah, of course. 
Oh, fuck. <laughs> what is the guitar company? Do you make guitars? Yeah, it's called God City Instruments. Um, so I, um, I, I don't personally make guitars at the moment. Uh, I have, um, but I do personally build pedals. So there's, there's sort of like three pro- major product lines within God City Instruments. There's, um, there's guitars and basses, um, and those are most of those are currently built in South Korea, and I sell those. At the moment, I sell those on my website and also at Chicago Music Exchange. I have a new batch coming in um, within the next few weeks, actually. Um, and there's also a fax pedals that I, I sell directly. And I do a little bit of contract manufacturing for that, but I also build a lot of that stuff myself. And then I also sell DIY PCBs for people who want to build their own pedals. I'm so fascinated by the fact that you can build pedals or like anybody that can do it. Like how it's, I don't know. It's just, it's so foreign to me. It's like, oh, build a TV. Like, how do you put the chips in the little thin thing? Like, what what is it that that makes the specific sounds in the pedals? Like, can is well, there a, is there an easy way to explain it? Yeah. Um. I mean, it's like anything. You know, it's like the same. Is you, you come into a recording studio and you're like, oh, how do you? You know, do you really know what all those knobs do? Like, no, I didn't at first, and then I slowly, I slowly learned, and then also I. You know, like a compressor is basically a compressor regardless of who manufactures it. And so like they look different, but the knobs kind of do similar functions and they, they may sound a little bit different. But, um, you know, once you learn how to use a compressor, you start to learn what to listen for and you can learn how to use another compressor. And the same is true, I think, with with anything, whether, you know, playing an instrument or or, you know, in this case, designing a pedal. Um, so the way in the way that I mean, I'm I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm an aerospace engineer by by trade, I guess, but um, I didn't do a ton of electronics work. But I do understand how certain configure certain circuit configurations work, and if I treat those configurations like a black box, like a, you know, like say a piece of outboard gear, like if I know that a certain certain configuration circuit configuration is an equalizer, then I know that I can patch that equalizer. Um, before or after a gain stage and based on how I choose component values within that topology, it's kind of like turning knobs on an equalizer, choosing resistor and capacitor values, sort of like turning knobs. So I, you know, I turn the knobs at a design stage and then I place that device before say a germanium transistor fuzz stage. And I know that if I um, have like a mid boost before that fuzz stage that I'm going to increase clarity and harmonic overtones. And I know if I have a bass boost before that, that it might get kind of like locky and, um, and mushy sounding. And so how I choose to set up my signal path within a pedal and what type of circuit configurations I, um, I put in that signal path I can kind of predict what the behavior of that circuit will be. Um, this is, this is, I'm talking about analog pedals here. Uh, yeah. And so that's, that's basically how I design pedals, you know, and I, and I have an idea about how to properly chain these things together. And while well, I, I don't necessarily understand like the material science as well as a lot of electrical engineers do, I understand enough of it that, um, that I can design some cool pedals. And, you know, this, this, there's not a lot of, real original thought in guitar pedal design there's a lot of schematics out there so once you start learning a little bit you can look at schematics and you can think like okay i like the sound of this pedal but what could i do to tweak that to make it more my own and um you know so like my circuits are none of them are clones of anything else but also none of them are revolutionary you know, I think there is a lot of revolutionary stuff happening within pedals right now, but most of that is happening with with DSP platforms that are in pedals. And um, I'm I'm not a coder. That's like a that's a skill that I haven't tackled yet. I don't and I don't know that I will go there. But um, I, you know, I may get into digital pedals at some point. But I'll probably like subcontract the development of the digital side of that stuff if I do. Oh wow. Yeah. Did you learn a lot of this stuff in college and school? Because I know you were you were a biomechanical engineer before, correct? Yeah, I went to school for aerospace engineering and then um, but I ended up working as a biomedical engineer for a while um, and then uh, was laid off from that job and with my was already moving lighting, doing my studio at that point. So I just kind of 
transition to music. And um, you got laid off like right when around when Jane Doe was coming out, correct? Correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I expected to have to go back and get a day job, but um, I, you know, I've been doing this for a while now and I'm st- still doing it. So hopefully I don't have to. So I guess Converge wasn't technically full time before Jane Doe? No, we've never really been a full time band. Um, I think we've had certainly had some busy years, but we've never really been like a career band. We've certainly never made like business goals. Uh, we've never put any business goals ahead of artistic goals in the band at all. Um, it's more just like something we've been driven to do and something we like doing together. And, um, you know, I'm certainly happy that we've sold enough records that it's that we've had a lot of opportunities to keep doing tours and playing shows. Yeah, because I remember, well, I mean, I was 16 at the time, so your perception is different. But even at that time, I guess when when Forever Comes Crashing is out, I remember Converge in my mind being like one of the top bands. So I guess in my mind, you're just always out there doing it, always touring. I but- mean, we might have been like a top band in our own little world, but like even like when Forever Comes Crashing era, like that era versus like even Jane Doe era, they're only like three or four years apart, but the the scene was very different. And the possibility of like earning a living playing music was very different just between those two eras. Like, you know, when we're cutting our teeth, there's like nobody we looked up to earned a living playing music. I mean, maybe some of the thrash bands, but we didn't think of ourselves as one of those kind of bands. Um, we just didn't think it would be, I mean, you know, we're playing like VFW shows to 20 people and, and loving it. And the idea that we could somehow parlay that into a career seemed impossible. I mean, and it still does, to be honest. I mean, like, you know, we play, you know, maybe once or twice a year, we'll play a festival to like 20,000 people. But that still doesn't mean that like we're earning enough money doing those sort of things that like we could retire on music. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I look at, I look at friends of mine that are like putting a lot of work into their bands and like, that's amazing. And I'm glad they're driven to do that. But I'm also like a little worried for them because like, you know, I, I feel like in, in our kind of world, like the best you can hope for financially is to be able to sa- sustain yourself while you're doing it. Yep. And unless you kind of find a way to get out of that economy of performing music, like there, it's re- really difficult to, to save money and build a life and save for retirement and stuff like that. I think, you know, what it wasn't my intention in starting a studio. And I don't think it was like Jake's intention in starting a record label, but like in doing that, we've taken ourselves out of that performance music economy a little bit. And, you know, we've put ourselves uh, into a position where like our career in music is a little more sustainable. And like, you know, we have, we have ways to earn beyond playing shows. Yeah. In fact, Kurt, I was thinking about you today and I was thinking about that very thing. Cause yeah, I have friends who were, in bands that were pretty big, they could live off the band. And that that itself is rare. But the band ends and then suddenly, what are you going to do? You have to get a job. I mean, your whole life changes. But you, you have the studio. It's a, you know, it's a prominent studio. People want to record there. So you, you have that. Yeah, I'm so, so thankful that I do. Yeah, because I mean, tour. no one can tour forever. Well, I guess you can if you're like, Bruce Springsteen or something, but, uh, yeah, but we, like, we are not Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just, at some point it becomes kind of sad. Like, you know, like every classic rock band is back together now because, you know, they all bought castles thinking that they're going to like, you know, keep making royalties forever. And then now they're not making royalties anymore. So they have to go on tour and they're like these old people that are just like, kind of stuck they need to earn i mean so and you know they're you know they have all kinds of infighting with their band members they've got to replace all kinds of members you know like converge hasn't had the same members since 1999 (laughs) you know like we're we're like a group of friends that like to play music together like we don't you know like there was one time where we used a fill-in member there was only one time and it was just because of you know ben ben broke his elbow and the timing you know we had these tours that were booked and plane tickets bought and you know other bands on tour that were counting on us and stuff so we, you know we got our friend Uriah to fill in on drums for those two but like we're, we're not we're definitely not like a go on tour to, to earn at all costs kind of kind of kind of band i'm really happy we're not in a position where we have to be how long did that drummer have to learn your songs 
Um, not very long. And it's the other thing too is one of the sets we had also agreed to play two shows in Tokyo. One of those shows having been a full album set. Oh shit! So he had to not only learn the set, but also a full album in addition to the set. Uh, but he's like, I don't know. He's a friend, fan of the band, and um, just a quick study. Too. He must like, be. I mean, our, our, well, the other thing that was crazy about him is that um, I didn't realize this until later, but he's like, he's a lefty on a righty kit person, mm-hmm. where Ben's a righty on a righty kit person. And he just, instead of playing the songs his own way, he's like, oh, I'm just going to learn how Ben plays it. Because, like, it would be too, I wouldn't be able to play the songs right if I played them like sticking lefty. So, you know, like a lefty on a righty kit. They're still going to generally like lead with their left hand when they do fills, but he just did everything. He just played everything backwards. Like he learned everything backwards for him so that he can stick it the way that Ben sticked it. Yeah. Cause the, the, I just thinking about learning a converge set on drums in a short amount of time is giving me anxiety. Yeah. I mean, I guess drums are the one instrument that like, if you know how the song goes, you can kind of just play the song. You don't necessarily have to know every little detail so yeah. long as you know how the song goes. And, you know, like he's he's doing like, I forget when it is. It's coming up pretty soon. He's doing one of those like guest drummer on one of the late night TV show things. Oh, nice. And, you know, like he's just going to learn how the song goes and and play along. And and he's he's not like bothered by any of that stuff. And that was actually like, when we were throwing around ideas about who was available and who could play drums in, in, um, instead of Ben, like that was a real big uh, thing in his favor is that he's the kind of person who's like not going to get bothered if he makes a little mistake. He's not going to get bothered if he doesn't like, you know, if he plays it a little bit differently or something like that. Like he'll, he's just like easy going like that. Whereas we knew some of the other people that like had the chops to play with Ben plays might get in their head their own heads a little too much and maybe tank a show because they got like um you know stuck on something yeah because the lot of ben plays is, is a total head fuck and so if you don't have like a like a relaxed attitude about it like you could really get yourself turned turned to knots exactly i mean it's i mean everybody in the band is just doing unbelievable things so i wanted to talk a little bit about uh jane doe now this is definitely a uh like a cornerstone album in our scene now. But um, going back to then, you know, I, I would say it was the beginning of your second phase as a band because the sound did change a lot. Talk about moving into that record. Now, I remember like the mindset and, and just kind of the creative, what we wanted to achieve creatively because the sound definitely shifted. I think it got way more aggressive. I think it got way tighter. And I think I remember you saying that you like invented a guitar tuning for that album. Um, the guitar tuning that I use a lot on that album came along um, on the previous record, The Poacher Diaries. Um, there's a song called, um, uh, I forget what the song's called. It's like the, the Wrestler song, whatever that one is. I play a bunch of slide guitar on that. And it's just like this open like C minor thing. Um, and I started doing it for that slide guitar part. And then was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And I started like writing other songs in that. And so that was one, I think, one major shift in Jane Doe. But like, no, the real, the real shifts with that is just like the shift in the lineup. So, like, I think Nate joins in '98, and yep. then Ben joins at the, at the very end of '99, and um, and then also, you know, Aaron, who was playing guitar for us at the time, he was really busy with Bane. Bane yeah, was like his other band. Um, they were really, um, you know the same thing that was going on with converge was happening with them at the same time. And he was like off touring with them a lot and really focused on that. And so he wasn't, he wasn't really around as much for the writing. And I think because of that, like we were like, it's easier for fewer people to just jam, mm-hmm. right? Cause you're, you know, you're not worrying about stepping on other people's toes as much. Like if there's just like one person per role, like one person on guitar, one person on bass, one person on drums. It's just, there's really just like three people playing together. It's a lot easier to jam than like with, with more people. So like, I don't know, I think our jams became more free and explorative and, you know, Nate was now bringing in material. Nate was a lot more, um, a lot more heavy handed with his critiques of what I was bringing in. 
um, to my dismay. And then also, <laughs> you know, Ben was like a much different drummer than Damon or John, his predecessors were. And he was, he was like, he, it's funny. Ben's like never been a skater, but he has like a very like skater mentality to, to drumming. Like, you know, like that, like, I think a lot of people, like when they hurt themselves, it makes them like want it makes them like afraid to do a thing again, but like with skaters hurt themselves, it like pisses them off and makes them try harder. Yeah. And he's like that with his drumming. Like if he can't do something like it pushes him to, to try harder to do it. It makes, it's like, he's not like a person who like wants to sit in his comfort zone. He's some, someone who wants progression, especially around that time period. Like he was, he was pushing really hard and he was also like, he was also like, Jake, Nate and I were like in our late twenties at that point, And Ben's like 19 and he's like a fan of Converge. So now like he's in the band that he's a fan of and he doesn't want to let the band, the guys that, you know, he looked up to down. So like we're pushing him and he's like rising to the occasion. Cause he doesn't want to like, you know, he wants to like take advantage of this opportunity. He doesn't want to let us down. Um, and so I think we got a lot of energy out of Ben that, that really pushed the band in, in a different direction than it would have gone otherwise. And, you know, I think those, those three things I think are the, the big factors in what caused the the shift in that, in that era of the band. That makes sense. It's just the new members, the new ideas, the new push. I guess that's why that's kind of the starting point for you guys live now. Like you, you dip back into older stuff sometimes, but not too much. Yeah, I mean, I consider, you know, because of the lineup changes and stuff, like I consider it kind of a new band at that point. Uh, it just, it doesn't have a new name, but it really feels like a, a new band started in that era because that that became the blueprint for what we did, for everything we did after. Yeah, I agree with you on that because I love the older Converge stuff because that's where I discovered you. But it it, it is almost like a new band when you start from Jane Doe and move forward. Yeah. Did you get thrown by... Nate's critiques like well you know he's new coming into the band he's younger were you like who's this kid to critique me um well no he's in the band because like we knew him well we had toured with Channel and Jesuit his two previous bands and like we knew what kind of person he was we we all like loved his writing but I think like like I think Nate thought that my writing was overly complicated and I thought that his writing was overly simple Ah. And I think we sort of pulled each other into the middle. Um, like he stopped, like I used to just be like, okay, I got, I wrote 12 riffs this week. Let's put them together in that order. Um, <laughs> and whereas like, he was more like, I wrote one riff this week. Let's play it and then jam on it and make noise for five minutes. Like to me, like that was like lazy. And I was like, I don't want to put more work into writing this song. But for him, you know, he would look at my songs as being like, why you got so many stupid riffs? Like it doesn't, it doesn't make for a good song when you have that many riffs. And like, you know, I think we, I think we both still sometimes have those tendencies. Um, but we also like took steps towards each other. And I think it made both of our writing stronger. Yeah. The balance of those two things is great because I think if it's too complicated, you can lose people. And if it's too simple, you can lose yeah. people. We have a lot of variety from song to song. I think that like, maybe that's another thing that sets Converge apart from our contemporaries is that like, you know, song to song, our, our music is different. Yes. And I think it's because we take different songwriting approaches to each song that that's how it came out, came out. Um, but also like our, without sounding like a, like, you know, like a Mr. Bungle record or something like that, I think we're pulling from a, a wide range of influence and we create, we try to create records that like are a journey from start to finish and not just one note. Yeah, because you and Jake and probably probably everybody in the band strike me as not people who got locked onto one type of sound or one type of band or one genre. Like, you know, you strike me as people who have like a very expansive set of influences. Yeah, and and which is which is a blessing and a curse, you know, like we're a band that rides fences. We we exist between worlds. Like we can function in different worlds. But we also are never like fully embraced by worlds either. I see. You know, like, like I mean, I think I think of us as a hardcore band, but like most hardcore kids would not call us a hardcore band. Like, you know, they'd call us a metal band, and like metal people would call us a hardcore band, or like, or some you know various subgenre 
I've heard us called like blood core. Or like, blood core. Know, like, that's a new one. You know, like I don't care about any of that. But um, uh, I mean, we were we were called metalcore before like the term metalcore became like what it became. Yeah, I don't even like to use the term metalcore anymore because when I think of metalcore in 2023, I think of that really produced like genty, you know, screaming yeah. uh, verse, think, singing chorus term, thing. I think the term metalcore is kind of over. Yeah. Too like I think I think maybe the the mid 2000s the the genre name metalcore had its heyday and I I think that it was sort of it was that sort of at the gates derived. Um, yes. But then they be later sort of became known as new wave of American heavy metal. Yeah. And yeah, I and mean, we you know we certainly weren't that. Um, I think we were just a band that was influenced by metal by metal and a band that was influenced by hardcore amongst other things. And therefore, we were metal core. Exactly. Yeah. Like when I think metal core, before now, I think of bands like Converge, meaning hardcore bands that have a heavy metal influence. Yeah. But everything's core now, so whatever. Yeah, there's a core for everything. Fucking I heard some. What it's, is what it's, is it's fashion I, now? Cottage yeah, core. I heard someone call. Oh, I'm not going to be able to remember it. It was uh, forget it. I'm not going to be able to remember. It was another core that was just dumb, and I hated it. Like I think Spotify invented the uh, the genre. Whatever it doesn't it doesn't matter. I mean that that's that's who should name genres is like <laughs> stream. I mean, a streaming platform needs to categorize things. That's true. So, like, because they're doing they're doing playlists and they're doing like stations and they they need to categorize things just like um, distributors and you know record sellers and marketing people, all that stuff. They they need to categorize stuff so they can put it next to other things and so they know where to place it in a catalog and where to place it in a record store and all that. And that's all that's all fine. But like, I don't think that artists should worry themselves with that stuff. No, not at all. Let everybody else define it however they want. So when Jane Doe came out, now we know now the the album, I think the album has just grown to great heights. You know, the imagery is iconic. So many people cite it as an influence and an important record. But talk about when it came out. I mean, what was the, the initial response? I don't really remember. You know, Nate talks about how people hated it. Um, I don't really remember. I mean, I think our, our like expectations of what people would think were probably different than what they are now. Mm-hmm. Um, we knew that it was different. I do remember that. I know that we, I remember that we didn't know if it was good until we had it all mastered and assembled into one album. Cause it, it had been recorded and mixed in a little bit more of a piecemeal way than records that we've done typically have been. And so it wasn't until like Alan Douches who mastered it, um, you know, put it all together and got a sequence and stuff that we were like, okay. This is uh, this is a record that we're proud of, and this is like a cohesive piece of piece of music, um, you know. And then I don't know, you know, so much stuff was happening around then, you know, like Aaron departed the band, I left my job, Nate had been living in Virginia, but he just moved up to Massachusetts around that time um, to like do a push on the band. Um, Jake was out of school, and he was ready to push, um, and. You know, then 9-11 happened, like basically the week the record came out. Yeah. And, you know, we went on tour. We also, you know, we we weren't sure if we were going to replace Aaron or not. We, you know, we hadn't decided if we were going to be a four piece or a five piece. So, like, we decided to do a tour as a four piece to see how it would go. Um, and so we did we did that tour. We did that tour of Playing Enemy um, from Seattle. And we felt good. You know, we felt like we felt good about the tour. It was a a strange time to to tour just because everyone was just sort of on their heels kind of reeling from the 9-11 thing and like you know there was all those other little things that happened around then like you know there was that plane crash in queens like maybe i don't know it was like a couple weeks later there was like a, a small plane that i think crashed into like the sears tower also that was like an un you know they were both unrelated but like we were just like what is going on in the world like is this is this the end times like so we're touring around we've got this new album that we're obviously like really behind but also like it felt like there's catastrophes lurking around catastrophe or at least uncertainty like lurking around every corner and you know crowds like really needed music and you know bands really needed to play and I was just, it was just, I just remember it as a really intense time period 
but I yeah, don't. you're getting hit from every angle. 9-11, everybody yeah. thought the world was going to end. New band, new sound, new members, lost a member. You're the only guitar player now. It's it's wild. Yes. There's so much going on. But I think I even knew then, I think I was even smart enough then to know that I should not be seeking out other people's opinions about my music. I was thankful that my friends told me they liked it. I was thankful that that like people were coming to the shows and it seemed it seemed like more and more people were coming to the shows. Uh, but also the scene was just growing a lot at the time anyway. So more people were coming to shows, you know, regardless of whether or not we had a good record. And yeah, I was I was just happy about that. You know, I do remember the second tour that we did on that record was with American Nightmare in the Hope Conspiracy and like just all three bands at that time were I think sort of at the peak of our live powers and the peak of our energy. We were all, you know, we all had our sights set to kill and just global domination, destroy the world. And um like the intensity that all the bands put out on those on that tour was um was pretty special. Um but yeah, I don't that's that's like the that's sort of what I remember about the time period and not I don't really remember too much about what other people were outside of my world were saying about the record. Yeah, I don't remember because now whenever you like I looked at uh, this is a tip for podcasters out there. Don't get information from Wikipedia because it's always wrong. Just get yeah. band member names and dates and discographies. That's it. But on the Wikipedia, it says Jane Doe was met with immediate critical appraise upon its release. And I, I don't remember that, but I don't remember people hating it either. But I do remember as the years went on, just the legend of the record grew and just so many people cited it as uh, influential and and you you know you just see the face everywhere everybody's got the tattoo it became this big thing like did you notice that from your end just kind of this thing growing into something bigger over the years yeah for sure um yeah i'm just i'm just thankful for it you know i'm thankful that it's the a record that i'm proud of has has done that you know something that i that i helped create has done that and it's something that i'm you know and i'm glad you know i'm glad it's like not a record that i'm embarrassed of because you know there's a lot of people <laughs> who are like they're just like ah oh, fuck we gotta play this song again at the state fair like uh like I'm, <laughs> I'm not like that you know i'm happy to play any of those songs i you know i still love that record yeah i what i like about it is it's even more vicious than the records before it like after jane doe came out a lot of bands I think the trend was to go lighter. If you're a heavier band, you go lighter, you go more experimental. And I, I got fed up with that. So I kind of stopped listening to a lot of the music for a while because I'm like, I invest all this time in this band and then they change their sound and I just can't do it anymore. But Converge did the opposite with Gene Doe. And I like that. Yeah. I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody wants to just keep repeating themselves over and over again for the rest of their careers. No, no, that's so you boring. Gotta, you got Yeah, you got to go. You got to do stuff that's that's authentic to who you are in that moment. And, you know, who we were in that moment was there was a lot of, you know, a lot of angst, a lot of, you know, anger, frustration. And there was, uh, you know, a need, a need to get that out. And that's that's why that record is what it is. How was it adjusting to being the only guitarist? Because, you know, usually amps. <laughs> that's that was going to be my question. And uh, more back problems. OK, because, you know, usually a. Um, you're you're down a member live. Everyone thinks, uh oh, here we go. Like this is not going to be good. But I would say, Converge has only gotten better over the years, and alive especially. And I think that's a, a testament to you and your skill. So what what's the secret? More amps, uh, more back problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think wasn't that different for me because um, for me, for me, I guess it felt more free. You know, like I was saying earlier, when it came to jamming, like it was just easier to jam when there's, you know, there's fewer people like playing live too was the same. Like it was more expressive because I didn't have to worry about like conflicting with what somebody else was doing. Yeah. And you know, there's more space on stage. There's more, there's a little more room in the van too. So like, there's just generally like more, just more elbow room in every way you can, you can think of with that. And so I, I, I liked that. And I had, I had been, well, I'll come back to this in a second, but, uh, also for, for Nate, like, you know, he's the guitar player who started playing bass. This is the first band he played bass in. So he's a guitar player. So he plays bass like a guitar. And so it uh, opened up 
space for him especially because now he could play bass more guitar like and fill in that space where there was a second guitar before and then also like he and Aaron shared a side of the stage too so now he's got all kinds of space on his side of the stage and it really like opened up his ability to fill up that stage both with with his sound and he started doing more vocals and you know he became much more of a um you know of a of an important part of the band at that point you know so prior to converge oh, or sorry prior to jane doe i was playing in this other band called the huguenots that uh, i played guitar in and i was the only guitar player um and I'll, actually all the bands i've been in like most of them have been one guitar band so i was like really comfortable with the um with the one guitar thing but the the huguenots is, was really more of the the predecessor to jane doe than like when forever comes crashing was you know like damon the drummer on when forever comes crashing he was definitely like a metal guy yeah and he had also had some like knee problems in the mid 90s and had some like knee surgery that kind of slowed him down a little bit um and so the writing that i was doing at the time i've always written for the drummer that i've been playing with and damon his like sort of taste and his the way that he played like I wrote when for, I was crashing, you know, I was trying to write what I wanted to write, but I also had to tailor what that stuff was to how Damon would play those songs. And, uh. um, and the stuff that I was writing that didn't fit in with how Damon would play, a lot of that stuff became Huguenot songs. And that I was really like, I was still enjoying playing in Converge at that time, but I was like a lot, I felt like my taste in music was much more in line with what the Huguenots were doing. And then like, you know, by the time Ben joined Converge, like I think the Huguenots had kind of run its course. And then like I was able to sort of bring that style of writing back to Converge because Ben was like the perfect. I know honestly, ben, like, ben would have been a great drummer in the Huguenots, too. I mean, Dan, Dan, our drummer was awesome, too. But um, but Ben was like more sort of in line with the Huguenot style. Like he didn't even play double bass when he joined Converge. He was more like a like a wild punk drummer than he was like a metal drummer yeah um so so yeah like my those those huguenots kind of sensibilities worked their way back into converge and um i think nate ben and jake all really liked that music too and they they welcomed that influence back into the band so yeah that was kind of like the the spiritual um predecessor to jane doe and that was a one guitar band that's really interesting. I need to go back and listen to that now. You know, it was that was some of like my very first recordings and it was just kind of done in my parents' garage and so like it's it's a little it's a little rough to listen to, but um I think a lot of the ideas are there and the songs are cool. And I I like the playing on that record or the Amazing. discography. You were in Kid Kilowatt too, right? I was, but that wasn't really my band. Um that was, was that more a Steven like, thing. Yeah, I was just kind of playing guitar. I mean, I did a little bit of writing in that, but I was really just kind of like playing guitar, which it was fun. It was just kind of like a gig, but it was it was fun. Uh, speaking of uh, Stephen, the first major recording project of yours was Until Your Heart Stops, yes? That was, a, I believe, the first album I ever recorded and mixed. Wow. What a first album to record, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I believe it's it's possible that the Drop Dead album was before that. I did a lot of the recording on Converge's um, When Forever Comes Crashing, but I didn't do that. I didn't do the entirety of that. But yeah, I think I think Until Your Heart Stops was the first thing, the first album that I did all of the recording and mixing of. Was that when uh, your recording setup was still in the basement in Alston? Yes. And I, re I heard a funny story that uh, the only time you got the cops called on you was when you recorded uh, Mosquito Control, ISIS. <laughs> Um, yes, <laughs> I'm not surprised. Isis was like unbelievable. They, they were the loudest band I've ever heard. And when they, they were like, I don't know if I want to say ahead of their time, but they were one of a kind, they would play oh, yeah. and they would clear out the venue. And I think that's just so awesome. Yeah. They were an incredible band. Um, and yeah, so this was just like the basement of a house. Um, so there wasn't any like soundproofing or anything. And, um, yeah, we were recording Caxide's bass and got the cops called on us. <laughs> How did your roommates tolerate you? They didn't. Um, <laughs> so when I moved into that, uh, my roommates were piebald. And oh, okay. A few, other, a few other friends. 
so yeah, I mean, I have a long, long relationship with those people. And like Aaron from Piebald, he was the bass player of the Huguenots. And um, Travis from Piebald was the bass player in my other old band, 7% Solution. Uh, John, the, the original drummer, was the drummer of that band as well. Um, but anyway, so yeah, we lived we lived in that house together. When I moved in to that house, which was the fall of 97, I think, um, I had a half-inch 8-track recorder and just a small mixing console and a handful of mics. And, you know, I was recording maybe one or two days a month and Piebald were pre- would practice in the basement maybe one or two days a week. And, you know, so there'd be like a few hours of activity of loud of loudness at a time. But then by the time I was recording Until Your Heart Stops, I had taken out a little loan and got a, a one-inch 24-track tape recorder and a Soundcraft Ghost console, so a little bigger console, bought some more mics and um, had a big rack full of compressors and stuff because, you know, this is pre-computer era. So, like, if you wanted to have eight channels of compression, you couldn't just buy one plug in. You had to buy eight compressors. Um, so I had, you know, a whole bunch of stuff in this basement and I was recording pretty much all the time. Like, when we recorded Until Your Heart Stops, um, I think that was done over a period of about three weeks and you know, we all had day jobs or were in school, but we would still be like recording all weekend, every weekend. And then like every night after work, we'd be doing guitar overdubs or vocals or something. And so I think by the, by the end of that year of living in that house, my roommates were like, you can stay, but your studio has got to (laughs) go. And so there was a big scramble for me to find a place to live and find a place to work um because i i didn't think i would be able to afford rent on both an apartment and a studio so i was trying to find like something that could be both you know i I ended up having to get two separate things but um the my friend brian mcturnan um he was doing you know he's he was doing salad days yes and still in massachusetts he's had you know a million different locations for his studio um but he had he had been working in norwood massachusetts um and he had some partners um at the time in norwood they moved up to this studio in gloucester mass because of a flood fun actually funny side story the building that they their studio was in had a big mosquito control sign on the side and (laughs) isis had recorded their demo with with uh, mike hill at that studio is that where the name came from the mosquito control yeah i think it was called like like new england mosquito control or something like that um I forget That's the name so of the cool. Business, but yeah, but like, but anyway, so, so they had this space that flooded at this industrial park in Norwood. And then, so they ended up moving the whole thing up to this place in Gloucester. And then their, their partnership like quickly fell apart after that. But um, it also in this industrial park in Norwood, they had another space that they were using as a practice space. And when those guys moved up to Gloucester, the both spaces became available but you know the one space had flooded, so like I didn't want to move into the flooding the flooded space. So I ended up like taking that space that had been their practice space, and I built that out and used that as my studio for about five years. Um, and I don't remember. Oh yeah, so that, yeah, this is like after I left um, that 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 house studio. And uh, you know, you must really have an ear and a talent for this thing because if until your heart stops is the first full record you record like i think that record still sounds unbelievable i would guess people still come to your studio now and say like hey how do you do this how do you do that from that record i want to sound like that i haven't heard that in a while but yeah i mean it does it does for one of my early recordings it does hold up pretty good like i would love to remix it i've mentioned it to those guys many times and like they just reissued it i really wanted to remix it there's a bunch of things about it that bug me i think i could do I think I could make it the same, but better. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, people are so wary of revisionist history with these sort of things that you have to be very careful about not changing things in a, in a negative way or, or modernizing it too much or anything like that. But there, I, I think I can make it the same, but better. But anyway, um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I don't know. I think I had an aptitude for it. And I also think that like it was done on tape, analog mixing console done quickly. There's not that many opportunities to mess things up you know the band were great they had they played the songs well they practiced all the time they were super tight they had good sounding gear i recorded it in a very simple way not a lot of microphones you know it's only on 24 tracks so there's not that much that i can do there's not that many places to go wrong and it all just happened pretty quickly 
and um you know it came together and it sounds good and i'm still you know i'm still really proud of it and, and i think it's a such an important record in my recording discography because it's the thing that that really set me on this path it's the thing that told that proved to myself that i could do it and it's also the thing that like proved to the world that i could do it and it's people started asking me about recording them more and more as a result of that record and i think if, if it hadn't been for that i might not have a career in recording music and i'm you know i'm so thankful that Kevin trusted me enough to help to have me work on that record with them and you know and now you know 25 years later they're back <laughs> <laughs> in a big way yeah yeah i love any record I th yeah, oh yeah, it's so good. You know, I think all of your experience is a good blueprint for anyone looking to build something out of this. I mean, Converge, people forget Converge was a band for what, nine, 10 years before we even get to where Forever Comes Crashing. So you're always playing, you're always improving, you're changing your sound, you're always getting better with the studio, you're just you know, putting this thing together piecemeal, starting small, figuring things out, building it up into what it is now. There's a... Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of a uh, great uh, sage advice there. Yeah, were you Thank looking you. for sage advice? Uh, yeah, you know what? Lay some <laughs> on us, otherwise it'll be awkward. I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll just uh, masterfully edit it together. Oh no, you can just leave that. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, my sage advice. Um, well, my sage advice is, I guess I have two major pieces of sage advice. If you're interested in really anything creative, I think um, just is do the work. Do it, do it now, do it often, don't ever stop. And hopefully something that you do will be good at some point because the first thing that you create is going to be bad. The first 10 things you create are going to be bad. If you have a 10% chance of doing something good and you write one song, it has a 10% chance of being good. If you write 10 songs, maybe one of them will be good. If you write 100 songs, maybe 10 of them will be good. Like you see where I'm going with this, like... And so it's dangerous to, especially like the older you get, the more, the less time you have, and the more developed your, um, your tastes are, the harder it is to start doing something because what you're going to do at first is going to be bad. Um, therefore, like you need to be okay with it being bad and just be happy to, to be making things like that. You know, that's how I was when I first started designing pedals. Like, you know, they weren't great. Um, especially I made a lot of mistakes, like the first pedals that I built. Um, but I loved doing it and I kept doing it and I started getting better the more I've done it and not everything I've, I've done with it has been amazing, but, um, the more of it that I've done, the better I've gotten. And the same is true with music. And the other th thing, the other sage advice I have for recording people is don't try to buy your way out of a plateau if you find your skills have stagnated or 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 even reversed um it's probably not because you need to buy a new microphone or a new guitar or or something like that it's probably you need to get into the you need to get in the woodshed and you need to just like work on your chops or you need to strip things back or you need to start over um it's it's not because like there's a magic piece of gear out there that's going to change your life yeah. i think that's great advice that's something that's come up on the show before too like uh embrace being bad like even yeah. you kurt baloo had to start making pedals that were not up to your standards and build to what you are now like everybody has yeah. to start at the start that being said, I will, my first couple of pedals were actually really good. <laughs> not, the, <laughs> not my first couple of builds. My first couple of builds were very messy, but my, well, my, my, I guess the Brutalist Junior is not my design. That's Nick Williams. Um, but sort of at my direction, that pedal's awesome. And the first one that I designed was the SBD, the, the, the Super Beetle Distortion Circuit. Um, that, that fuzz is awesome. And I just got really lucky. And then, um, but then I've done, I did a bunch of stuff after that that wasn't as good, um, but never saw the light of day, but that's okay. Oh, and one last piece of advice. The, the one exception to where you can't throw money at a problem when it comes to recording is acoustics. So um, monitoring environment is supremely important. And that's the one place where money like really does matter. Um, and if you are plateauing and trying to buy your way out of a, um, of a plateau, 
spending some money on a proper listening environment, which starts by properly treating the room or properly designing the room even better. And, and then also includes um, speakers and speaker placement. Um, so it doesn't matter how fancy your compressors are. Like if you can't hear what you're doing, you're not going to be able to make good decisions. That's good advice. You know, I had uh, Jay Moss on the show, a fellow producer, and he said you helped him out in the beginning. He'd send you mixes and you'd reply back and be like, why is this so high or why is that? And then eventually he sent you something and you were like, this is the best thing you've ever done. Do you ever, do you still do that for people? Do people still hit you up for, uh, for advice and, uh, you know, critique? Yeah, here and there. I mean, most of my recording friends are like pretty far along in their careers at this point, but you know, I have like, you know, I've got like text threads with music, with, um, you know, with recording friends and we'll, we'll sometimes be like, Hey, I'm stumped on this mix. Like, can I, can I show it to you? And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll help each other out and stuff. So, so yeah, I, I definitely do still do that. Yeah. I guess it depends on the day. Like sometimes someone might email me with something and I'm like, I don't even have time to think about this. And sometimes I might take them up on it. It, it just yeah. depends. Like I, I don't usually have time to like do mixed critiques for like people that I don't know. Yeah. Um, but you know, like f- friends that like would also like give me, give me like a, a listen if I needed, if I needed help, I, I'll do, I'll make some time for that. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Are you happier now that you are recording Converge? I mean, I guess so, right? Because you can get more of what you're looking for. Yeah. You know, I think I, if I were, I would be a very high maintenance client um, (laughs) to another recording engineer. Yeah. I think that, I mean, I think that's why I originally started recording because I was a high maintenance client and I kind of, I think I kind of got the sense that I was a pain in the ass. And so I started recording myself partially because I wanted to just like learn about the process some more so I could be less of a pain in the ass when it came to recording, be more prepared when it came time to record my band. And then that just sort of developed into me recording my band. And I, I look at it now as just two sides of the same coin to me, like the, the recording of the music is kind of part of the writing process. I think a lot of people look at, look at things that way, you know, like, like, I don't, you know, talk to like an electronic musician, for example, like there's no distinction between writing and recording for, for them. And that's kind of how it is for me. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's all part of the process. Yeah. I mean, I I think I could record a converge record with somebody else, but it would be, it would be probably emotionally difficult for both me and the engineer. (laughs) No, I, I totally get that. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't want anyone to work on this podcast with me. Like I used to have a co-host. I don't anymore, but I wouldn't want to bring someone else into that because I, I'm afraid that I would annoy them too much with like, you have to yeah. be here on time. You have to do this. And with editing, I'm even nervous about that because I, I feel like I'd be too particular. And I would, I would guess you're the same way with recording because you know exactly what you want. Yes, I do generally know what i want but also i don't necessarily know how to get there and yeah I have, to, I have to find it and so what happens a lot in the studio is i'll work with somebody who you know they have a sound in their head that they need to find and it requires some work and some exploration to find that sound and part of that exploration is them kind of sometimes is them mixing through my hands mm-hmm. and that's that's not always like that's that's not the most fun thing to be doing, you know, but it's necessary sometimes, especially if I'm not nailing what they're after. Like I haven't, you know, explaining to somebody else what you want is hard because you have to try to, you know, you've got a feeling in your head. You've got to convert that to words. You have to speak those words. Another people has another person has to hear those words. They have to interpret those words into their own feelings. And then they have to like take that interpretation of your idea and then manifest that in the real world through equipment and settings you know there's a there's a lot that can be lost you know in that in that translation and so having your your if you have the gear and you have the skills like having your own hands on that gear i think is is really good you know but it can also you know it can be a dangerous thing too or you can or you can end up like repeating yourself too much you know or you or you you lack you're you end up like creating too much in a vacuum and it, it lacks like the energy that comes from collaboration. So I think, I think I've gotten pretty good at not getting stuck in those ruts anymore. But I I think I, if I were trying to make a record, a converge record with someone else, I think there, 
I'd have to I'd have to work real hard at letting go and accepting that things uh c- things can be different than I want them and still be just as cool as the thing that I have in my head, even though it's different from what it's in my head. Do you think it's a possibility that someone, not you, could record a Converge record in the future? I think it's unlikely we would do that. Um, just uh, for, as in like an engineer, I think it would be kind of fun because I, because, you know, the, the classic era of, you know, recording when there's like, you know, studios with multiple rooms and you hear about like, you know, Judas Priest and Dion Warwick, like bumping elbows in the hallway or I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. not a true story, but like, you know, like things like that, the kind of like collaboration and cross pollination that happens between musicians and engineers, like bumping into each other in spaces that and and mentoring each other and stuff that doesn't really exist so much in the modern era of recording um so i've developed most of my skills you know partially in a vacuum there's a lot more online learning tools now when i was starting so like i think people are you know learning stuff that way but like i kind of had to just kind of teach myself most things um i i love the idea of like working with an another engineer just so i can be like oh you're doing that really oh that's how or or like like anytime i'm in a room with another recording engineer like they'll do something in pro tools and be like whoa what was that command whoa oh wow there's that this thing that i've been like doing like five keystrokes to do you can do with one keystroke or like little things like that is fun to learn but but seeing just like how other people mic stuff is always interesting and what results they get from that and i don't i don't get exposed to a lot of that kind of stuff in in my day-to-day so I think that aspect of it would be interesting and maybe would produce some like unique results, but like, just like the economy of it, like why would we hire somebody and then like travel to another studio and like pay for lodging and all that stuff? Like when we have the ability to do all that stuff ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. That's the thing. I don't think it makes sense, Um, but you know, it would be, it would be interesting. I have an idea for you, Kurt, and I'm sure nobody has ever thought about this or mentioned it to you and Converge. Okay, get this. Okay. Converge Classics Tour, right? We open with Conduit. We go right into Shallow Breathing, I Abstain, Some Saddest Day, Some Farewell Note, Poacher Diaries. What do you think, huh? Um, No. <laughs> well, I also, uh, for A, no, and B, um, we have... Uh, you know, we have a lot of different tunings that we use. Yes. And so our, our, our sets have to be kind of like paced by, um, by tuning as well. And like, you know, I'm not, uh, okay. So when I go to see a band, like I love hearing the hits, I love hearing the songs that I love, but I also love seeing a band that are playing music that they feel like deeply connected to. Yes. And like music that I wrote, 25 years ago with a different lineup of the band is not music that I feel super connected to anymore. Um, And also like, I don't play guitar like that anymore. So it would, you would, it would, it would be like going to watch a bunch of like 50 year old guys cover some songs. (laughs) It wouldn't really be like going to watch the band that originally recorded those songs. No, I get it. And I, I actually respect Converge. I always think of Converge in this light. Like I, You're almost like Radiohead in that you you make people embrace what you're doing now. And I really respect that. And uh, I think you yeah. should because you've continued to be great throughout the years. That being said, like I, I do sympathize with this thing because like, how fucking cool would it be if Radiohead played a show now and played Creep? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if they finally were just like, you know what? fuck it it's a good song yeah like, fuck it like <laughs> you know what i mean like we're gonna we're not gonna be so like precious about this anymore or like the other thing that i would love 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 to see like you mentioned springsteen earlier yes i would love to see okay you know how there's that like john cafferty song i think it's called on the dark side but everybody thinks it's springsteen no like you, you, you i guarantee you know this song it's like i have to go listen to it yeah <laughs> it's from it's from it's it's from the soundtrack to um fuck what's the name of the movie uh, i'm gonna look it up i know it's i know you're not supposed to like get on the internet while you're no on let, let's do this here anyway. on the dark side uh it's it's from this the film uh eddie and the cruisers and eddie and the cruisers is it's sort of like it's kind of like velvet goldmine in that it's like a biopic but 
an unauthorized biopic. So like the names and faces have been changed. And, and so like Eddie and the Cruisers is kind of the story of Bru- the unauthorized story of Bruce Springsteen. Oh. So it's like, this is like a song written in the style of Bruce Springsteen. I guarantee, you know, you, if you put on the song, you're going to know it. Like, it's just like a very, it's like of the canon of classic rock. It's just like a classic, classic rock song from the early eighties. And, but everybody thinks it's Bruce Springsteen. And I just think if Bruce Springsteen someday played that song, it would be amazing. Cause he's got the, he's, it's like right in his range. Like he would kill it. It sounds like it's a song from born to run. And I feel like if he played it, two thirds of the audience would just be like, oh, cool. Yeah. I like this song. And then like one third of the audience would just be like, oh my fucking God, he's right. playing this. <laughs> like, I just think it'd be the coolest thing. And I would love to see like other examples of that kind of stuff, you know, like. Yeah. You it's know. like you said, I respect Radiohead for hating creep and not playing it unless it's like one of those new interpretations of it. They do with all the electronics and stuff. And Oh, do they do that? Yeah, they, they did. They did. Uh, they did some, I think in 2016 or so. I read about it recently. It's like creep, but it's new and it has a lot of electronics in it, and it's very different. And they haven't touched it in a long time, so that was cool. Oh, so it's like, like with Converge, I respect that you stay focused on the newer stuff that is you now. But it would also be cool. Well, you, you. I mean, you play Saddest Day sometimes. Yeah, we just our our deals. We don't rehearse it. Yeah, I was gonna, you. That's that's the rule, right? You never practice it. Yeah, there's no <laughs> I mean, like we'll like like quickly like be like, all right, just make sure I know how the riffs go before we like go on stage. Yeah, but, like yeah, we're not gonna like practice. But I tanked like the last time we played it, I tanked it. Yeah, um, didn't you have to? Didn't you like have you forgot a guitar part, so you just like kind of yelled the part? <laughs> well, yeah, there's like a this there's like a clean guitar part in the middle that like goes into a bass part that's like kind of the same thing. And I just like we got there and I just thought the bass part was gonna happen. <laughs> and I was like, look at it, Nate, like, why aren't you playing the bass part? And he's just like, why aren't you playing the guitar part? <laughs> and then I, yeah, but you know, it was the kind of show where that's, that was okay. I'm curious. I've always been curious. Uh, Poacher Diaries, the drummer you had on that recording, that guy was unbelievable. And those songs are unbelievable. And he left, I think, right after that recording. What happened? Um, he just wasn't um, a person who wanted to, to tour. And I mean, we're still friends with him. Like I talked to him last week. Um, yeah. And he's a, he's a good guy. He, um, you know, we had, we asked him to join the band pretty quickly and, um, he came in and helped us out and he was in the band for a little bit less than a year. We did a few tours. We did our first European tour with him. And I think that probably didn't help his position because like, it was probably the hardest tour we've ever done. Ah, and you know, like he was probably just like, oh, this is how this is going to be. Like, fuck this shit. <laughs> what was hard? Um, like, was about that tour? Our, it was just our first time in Europe. Oh, okay. And so we didn't really know what to expect. It was 99. So, you know, so it's, it's, it's like, you know, the, the Berlin Wall's down. Um, and there is an EU, but there's not like a Euro currency yet. Um, we are, you know, I think when forever comes crashing was out. I don't think the poacher diaries was out yet. May it might've been, but when forever comes crashing was out, but you know, we're a pretty small band at this point. So, you know, we, we just sort of had to, had to, it was a kind of a beggars can't be choosers situation Uh, with like, you know, everything on the tour, like the, you know, the booking agent, the shows, the, you know, the, um, well, we, what we got for transportation and stuff, but you know, we met a lot of great people. We, we met a lot of great bands. We made some great connections there. We played good shows. Um, we had good experiences, but it was just like it was just like a physically and mentally exhausting kind of tour. Like I was, I was doing it with broken ribs, and like we're sleeping, you know, basically like sleeping on stages, sleeping backstage, sleeping in the van, and you know, we've got like ten people and a sprinter. Um, cause for some reason we like brought a bunch of friends with us. <laughs> um, it just, we, you know, we did everything wrong too. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, there's nobody made any money on the tour. And, um, so you know, it was just a, just a, you know, just a tough, generally a tough tour. And, you know, we didn't go back to Europe for a few years after that. Cause we were like, you know, fuck that place. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it was a real crash course in uh, touring Europe, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, we didn't have, we we hadn't had a lot of friends tour Europe yet. So we didn't really have anybody giving us advice, you know, to say like, hey, you know, you should really do this when you go over there. The only, the only people I talked to about touring Europe were, um, I think it was like Brian McKernan. And like Battery, for some reason, was this like anomaly. They were like huge over there. Um, well, it seemed like, okay, so at the time, it seemed like New York hardcore and like youth crew style hardcore were pretty big in Europe, but like other types of hardcore hadn't really caught on yet. So like those like youth crew style bands could go over there and have some pretty big shows. And so we were kind of expecting like, oh yeah, every band is big in Europe. We're going to go over there. It's going to be great. Um, and it, it wasn't, it was, um, you know, it was a tough tour. And, um, you know, so I think that was part of the reason John didn't maybe, well, it definitely what didn't like motivate him to stay in the band and say that. That makes sense. Yeah, it was a, a a rough first experience. Yeah, I've often described Saddest Day as the hardcore slash metal Bohemian Rhapsody. What do you think? Accurate because, or no? Because it because it has so many riffs. <laughs> yeah, there's just so many different parts to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does have an Inspector Gadget riff. Yeah, um, but the first time so. my friend pointed that out, I was like, "What are you talking about?" Like, I I couldn't, and then like years later i listened to it and i was like oh because like to me these bands were so cool and everything was so underground i was like no this is like precious like uh i don't know i held it to a very high regard i still do but you know what i'm saying but uh, yeah. is it actually from inspector gadget like you actually no i mean that's i think that was sub it, i mean it definitely is but i think that was subconscious yeah like, there's there's definitely conscious um plagiarism in that song but I don't think I thought it was just like, oh yeah, cool Slayer riff. Um, yeah. But then like when somebody pointed it out, it was like, oh fuck, you're right. I mean, I loved Inspector Gadget when I was a kid. And like, you know, Dr. Claw was the first like death metal vocalist I ever heard. Um <laughs> so <laughs> that's one but, thing I didn't comprehend about all that because I I went right from new metal, a brief stint in new metal right into the craziest bands like Converge, Dillinger, Escape Plan, Botch, Coalesque, all of that. That was my entry point. For this music i skipped over all the classics so to me like the un like the underground hardcore stuff that was really cool but like anything mainstream even if it was good was dumb and it wasn't until years and years later that i realized like the mainstream stuff inspired all of these bands that i think is cool like my friend put on a uh machine head song at practice he's like you have to hear this breakdown and then i heard the breakdown and i'm like oh that's like where hate breed got their that style they do on the breakdowns. I'm like, Oh, it's like, it's all connected now. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I would, I would think Capri probably got stuff more from like, from like uh, Sepultura for me, machine head is still like the guy from violence's other band. Like I was, I was like I'm a few years too old for new metal. Like I was like, I was, I'm like the perfect age for like, grunge and new metal to be like the enemy because i was already like i had been into punk and hardcore stuff for like a year or so when like grunge came along so i was like the perfect age to be like super pretentious about like oh you know like <laughs> oh like uh, this isn't real punk but you know yeah. or like or also being like i've been wearing vans like for like a year longer than you <laughs> like shit like that and then like you know same with like new metal like i saw new metal is like something that like kind of diluted what i was doing yeah like I, like I saw new metal is like a like a commercialized like not artistic kind of version of what i was involved in but that that like normies would think was what i did exactly like i'm 41 now and yeah. you know i i liked corn up until the third album i think and then i discovered hardcore right around then and then i was out and then new metal really blew up so i got out of it but mm -hmm. one thing i didn't even comprehend until i started doing the show was like yeah there was people already into this who were into it pre-nirvana so that you yeah. know like grunge to them like yeah, you I'm said like, was the enemy i'm like just before i mean nirvana is awesome of course yeah but like yeah uh i mean i remember hearing nirvana on like college radio Wow. But like, but I didn't know bleach. Like I wasn't like a, I didn't know anything about that scene. Like I knew that, like, I knew that like the muffs were a band and I knew that like, um, what's Mark arms band, um, I'm spacing right now. Um, 
but yeah, like I like I knew about some of that shit, but like I knew about Soundgarden, but like it wasn't my scene. But yeah, like so I didn't I I don't think I had ever heard Bleach, even though I was like around listening to punk in that era. But then I did hear Nevermind and being like, oh whoa, this is fucking awesome. Um, but I was like in I was like into like Pixies and Sonic Youth and stuff like that at the time. Yeah. So it wasn't like that much of a stretch for me. But then, like, all of a sudden, Nirvana was everywhere, and they were huge, and, like, the people that used to, like, put me in a headlock and punch me in the face during gym <laughs> class liked Nirvana, and so, therefore, I didn't like Nirvana. Yeah, I get annoyed I by that. eventually. Because when I, when I went to school, I was a freak for liking, well, for like, if you, if you liked anything, you got made fun of, but if you liked music, if you were really into music, or like I liked Korn and Marilyn Manson, the early stuff, and I was a freak for that. And now like even gaming, were like now, freak? but were you on a leash? Of course. Yeah. I, I, I was a freak on a leash. That's the way it goes. Now I'm thinking about that stupid video with the bullet <laughs> flying around now. And like now there's like gaming even like jocks have co-opted gaming. Like there, there's professional gamers, but they're like, oh, bro, here's my eating regimen. And I go to the gym and I'm annoyed by that. Like uh, we, they've taken everything from us. That's, that's so interesting. Yeah. It's a whole thing. Have you watched that show? Uh, I think it's called Players. No. It's kind of awesome. It's I'm like on Twitch a... 24 hours a day. I just watch people stream. Okay. So yeah players is I, i'm not a gamer at all like i checked out like as soon as like i'm gonna say as soon as street fighter came along i checked yes. out of gaming like i don't i anything like that was dexterous like combat type of games yeah um i had no interest in and then especially like i think it was probably because i just wasn't good at them but it seemed it seemed like like playing like street fighter like mortal Kombat, that stuff seemed like a sport i didn't like it yeah um but and it was also like way too competitive, which I didn't like. That's not why I liked games. Like I liked Tetris and Pac-Man and stuff like that. Um, but then like once the like, the first person shooters came along, I was totally out. Like I mean, I like I like like Big Buck Hunter, but like you know, I think like maybe House of the Dead was that like one of the first? Yeah, first that was one of those light gun games. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I was really not into that stuff. Um, it was just like too loud, too violent. Like, and I just wanted to like play puzzle games. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely not a gamer, but anyway, no, there's a show called, I think it's like a, I think it's like an Amazon show, maybe. I don't know. I forget what some, one of the big streamers has this show called players and it's kind of like, it's kind of got like a Silicon Valley feel, but it's about, um, it's like a spoof on competitive gaming. I got to check that out. I, 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 I don't game competitively. I'm not good, but like, I, I like it. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I have my finger on the pulse of the scene. It's like something I like to watch, but I don't partake necessarily. Yeah. It's like the show like centers around league of legends. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's funny, but I also know nothing about gaming. So I'm, I'm not an insider at all. Yeah. It, it's come a, a long way there. It's a, it's a whole billion dollar in industry now. It's wild. But, uh, Kurt, Tell us what's coming up for Converge. Are we working on new music? When can we expect a new record? Lay it on us. Yeah, um, I don't know when we can expect a new record, but um, we are writing material. And when we have enough material to record an album, we will record an album and then we will release it. And that's pretty much how it goes in Converge. And um, so we're not like, you know, we're not on any kind of schedule where we need to get anything out by a certain time, but we do want to keep keep writing and releasing music. The, the current thing that we're working on right now is like, you know, making sure that all of our back catalog is in print. Um, and I think the next the next one up is uh, The Dusk in Us, um, which is like the most recent proper Convert album. But like we have like a, a new version of the deluxe album that's going to have some um, some recent live material on it that's um, that's in the works. I love that. Yeah. Oh, and and quickly before you have to go. The Blood Moon, the 2016 tour. Well, the the record with Chelsea Wolf, that's great too. But the two that Blood Moon 2016 tour, I thought that was a great idea because some of my favorite Converge songs are like songs you probably wouldn't hear in the set, like Wretched World. So to be able to see that live, that crowd was very lucky, I think. Yeah, I, I love doing it. And that's like a that's something we've been doing on the tours for the new material as well. That song in particular. Um it's really fun to do. And I, I love that we get to do that. And then we also get to play like wild punk shows on the street in Austin, Texas at the same yeah. time, you know, like, like, I think 
you know, this summer I was like realizing that we, we, the two shows we played in a row, like one was like, I just said, like on the street in the middle of the day in Austin, Texas, wild punk show where we were playing the saddest day. And then like the next show we played after that was like, I think was Hellfest. No, no, we played a couple shows in the States before that with blood moon, but yeah, you know, like giant, nice air conditioned venue in ear monitors, backing tracks, light show, like seven person version of the band like you know the, as opposite as you can be from like a sweltering punk show in the street and i'm really <laughs> happy that <laughs> that like people are willing to come and watch both of those and then i get to do both it, it really is incredible i mean you get to write uh beautiful symphonic songs you get to write the heaviest songs i've ever heard crazy shows on the street, uh, the air conditioned, uh, huge shows like you're talking about. I mean, you get to do everything. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. With the blood moon stuff. Like we, we played like seated venues over the, over the summer. Like <laughs> this is the opposite of a convert show. Those people are sitting down watching us. Are you, any chance of those happening over here? Because I'm 41 now I'm tired. I don't like going out as much. So the idea of <laughs> sitting down for a convert show is very appealing to me. Yeah. We'd love to do more of that stuff. Um, we don't have any plans at the moment, you know, like Chelsea's working on new stuff and, you know, Converge Classic, as we call it, is um, working on new stuff. But, you know, maybe maybe after those projects have a chance to do their own thing for a little bit, um, we'll get back together and do it. You know, it's tough, like being in a band with seven people, um, a lot of schedules have to align and a lot of there's a lot of logistics to do in those shows that, that um, need to be accounted for. Big time. So Converge Classics Tour, where we play old stuff, not going to happen, but possible Blood Moon shows in the future, it's a possibility. Yeah. never Sounds say, good. Never say never. <laughs> well, Kurt, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show. You know, I've been listening to you for a really long time. Converge is one of the first bands that got me into this whole thing. I appreciate what you and everybody in the band is doing. So keep it up. Thank you. No problem. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, have a good day. And there you have it. Kurt Ballou. Wow. Wow. What a great conversation. Like, I never know what to expect when I talk to anybody. So when, it, you know, when it's someone like Kurt Ballou, I really didn't know what to expect exactly. There's there's not a ton of interviews out there with him like this. He doesn't do a lot of podcasts, you know, and I looked on YouTube and there's not there's only like one interview bordering on an hour that I saw, but you know, he seemed like a nice guy and he really turned out to be and wow, just just a great conversation really spanning everything he's done, which is so much. I mean, Converge played the first big hardcore show that I ever went to. And I was blown away by them then. I'm still blown away by them now. And th I mean, there was just so much interesting stuff that he had to say that I wasn't even sure of. Like the thing that jumps out to me the most, Jeff, he was, uh, he said he was kind of writing when Damon was still drumming and they still, you know, they were still a five piece. He said he was writing to fit their playing kind of, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then once uh, Nate and Ben came in, he went back to the style of that single guitar band he was in where he could be, you know, that was like more of his thing. I thought that was really interesting. I can't remember the name of the band he mentioned, but I need to go back and listen to them. Was it the Huguenots? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, I, I liked hearing him talk about how he, they would get in there and they would, he would write 12 riffs and be like, all right, let's play them all in order. And then when Nate came along, it was like, no, I wrote one riff, let's play it and then jam. And that's, you know, that's the new converge formula. And it's a good one. I feel, I feel a kinship there. I feel a kinship in a lot of what he said. So when he said that, I, I, I kind of felt like him, you know, I like to bring things to practice done as much as possible because I hate jamming. So when I heard like jam on this for an hour, I was like, oh, I would have hated that too. But, <laughs> but you have to because that's how, I mean, that's spontaneous jamming and just figuring things out. That's how a lot of really great stuff happens. Yeah. Well, I mean, jamming, if you're self-conscious, you feel pretty exposed and um, you're like, oh, am I playing? Is this good? You know, and you're worried that people might be judging you or whatever. But once you get 
past that, then yeah, I think the real, the real good stuff happens. So I, I, I liked hearing that. And, uh, Kurt did shoot down my idea of the Converge Classics tour. I, I had a feeling that he would, but look, look, I had to try. <laughs> I had to try because those songs are so good. You know, from Caring and Killing up to Poacher Diaries. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You say that Converge was the first big hardcore show you ever went to. Converge played the very first show I ever played in a band. Are uh, you serious? I'm serious. Um at this place called Studio 158 in, uh, I think, Willimantic, Connecticut. And, you know, it was my first band. We weren't very good. Um, same guy that I would, that played Quicksand for me. Um, and we, you know, we were in a band and uh, it was, it was not very good. But um, <laughs> I used to call uh, Jamie Josta because he, he booked shows all over Connecticut. And um, I would call him like every week, like, hey, are, are there any shows? He must have hated it. You know, he's getting calls from all these people who, whose bands are, you know, just new and um, they're just trying to catch a break and start playing shows. And so I called him all the time. And finally he's like, yeah, what, how about this show? And uh, so, so we played, I don't remember it at all other than um, being really nervous. And uh, I think there was like a, like a 12 inch stage or something. And, but yeah, converge. So I always like to think about that they were they were there for my first show what an amazing first show to play totally i don't remember any of the other bands either <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i've been listening to converge since i got into this music so i'm just really thrilled that kurt came on the show and look at everything he's done i mean the god city all the bands he's recorded the first real recording project he did was until your heart stops it was great hearing about that and just uh, different eras of Converge. And I do credit with Converge with getting me back into heavy music because I, I was kind of out of it for a bit. I was listening to a lot of post-rock. I was busy getting fucked up and running around Philadelphia. And I, I just became disillusioned with hardcore because a lot of my favorite bands were going softer and you know putting out rock albums and I was getting sick of it. I even thought Converge did that. I, this is how dumb I was. Like, you know, Cave In put out Jupiter and they went in that direction. And I, I wasn't happy with it at the time because I was an angry kid. And I just assumed Converge did that too with You Fail Me, which is completely wrong. <laughs> like, right. that is not what they did. So I, I was just like, oh, I'm not listening to any of this anymore. But then Converge put out No Heroes. And I really liked that. And that kind of brought me back into things. And so I'm grateful for that. Yeah. I mean, so prolific it's incredible like when did they become a band who knows right it's uh, how long ago i have to like pop 89 on. 90 oh my god think about yeah. that god how many years ago was that it's so long ago i have to do the math in my head but i mean they've done so much and you know what i really liked hearing was that they just he was saying we've never been a full-time band we're just people who like to get into a room and play together and that keeps it pure you know there's no there's nothing else driving it other than the pure passion for making the music together and knowing that you have this this chemistry and this formula that works and i i really felt that it, it was just really good to hear that that blew my mind when he said that because i realized he was right yeah yeah you don't hear about converge on tour four times a year right it's like when it happens, it's a big deal. You're like, oh, Converge is on tour. Like, I'm going to go see him, you know? So, yeah, I think it's I think it's really great to hear that. And I hope that other bands will hear that and think, you know what? That's, that's kind of the way, right? Take a break, do some other stuff, recharge, and come back to it. And you'll make the best music of your life. Exactly. So, Kurt, thank you. That was great. And now we can check converge off of the new scene guest list jeff well, you're gonna have to have him back on in two years uh, sh <laughs> listen if he wants to come back he can come back believe me yeah <laughs> <laughs> um wait so we were talking uh before we started recording this jeff and you said kurt used to mess with you guys <laughs> when he was recording you back in the day is that true i've heard he's very funny like he has a great sense of humor he does he has a really good sense of humor and i feel like he's he's good friends with our friend jack shirley who's recorded the the two records we've done since since we got back together and so you know eric and i hang out with jack pretty regularly um 
you know, he's, he's not just somebody that records us, but he's our friend. And, you know, we go out to dinner and do stuff like that. And he'll, he'll just be like, Oh, Kurt did this the other day or Kurt said this the other day, you know? So I always feel like I'm, I, I know what's going on with Kurt, at least, um, on the periphery, you know, but, but yeah, we, we were recording, um, presents and, um, I was doing the vocals for his life is my denim paradise all day, every day. And he sort of did this like hip hop dance when I, when I was saying the lyric shot, the throat, got your goat. <laughs> and he was just like walking around in, in the, in the booth. And he's just, like, you know, it's just like, I had to stop cause he was just doing it while I was doing it. It was really funny. I was like, dude, <laughs> you know, but, but he just, he, he made it feel really um, light and comfortable and safe um, in a fun way. And I really appreciated that. I don't know if I ever told him, you know, I was just like a kid who had no idea what I was doing and everything was just always kind of crazy. And, um, but in, in reflecting on that, I realized that he, he made it feel, um, safe when we were recording with him. I like that. Yeah. But, you know, before I talked to him, I imagined him being like really serious, you know, because he's Kurt Ballou from Converge, but it just talking to him, he was super nice and did have a great sense of humor. So it was nice. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good guy. So Jeff, Let's talk about our favorite subject, ourselves. <laughs> How are we doing? And I want to start with you, Jeff, because it's been a minute since I've had a guest co-host, and it's been a minute since I've spoken to you. I went back and looked, Jeff. You have not been on the show since August 2021, yeah. which feels like a century ago at this point. It feels like forever. Um, and I, when we did it, I was actually at Eric's apartment. Um, and he, I think he kept interrupting me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he interrupted <laughs> me a lot. And, you know, Eric, Eric likes to talk. So he, he, he's like just going on and on and on. And he's, if, when he hears this, he's going to laugh. <laughs> were, you, uh, were you upset at all? Like when, when the mics went off, were you like, Eric, I, I could have handled that. Like, do you get into it like that? Or is it just, you just let Eric do his thing? No, I let him do his thing. He's, uh, you know, he, he usually has good stuff to say. So um and if i if i need to i'll i'll interrupt him or whatever so yeah yeah like i have friends i know when i'm with certain friends i'm going to be doing a lot more listening than talking and i've learned to just accept that because they're my friend and i like them so i'm like okay like i i don't need to talk about myself for this 15 minutes or however long we're together right yeah i mean eric and i we talk on the phone all the time even even now even when we're not uh at practice or whatever you know i talked to him today for like 45 minutes and then i was oh, like really? yeah yeah well i mean we're just talking about like upcoming stuff and um but then i was like dude i gotta go <laughs> <laughs> yeah he'll keep going and going he's like yeah me too i gotta go do some stuff do you remember uh, my co-host tommy yeah 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 he's like eric like he could talk and talk and talk and i i would have to like cut it off right imagine we need to put tommy and Eric together, it would be like a talk off. <laughs> It'd be like a five hour episode. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> but Jeff, what's going on with you? How are you? T what's going on with you personally? Lay it on us. Uh, I'm, you know, it's good. Uh, I mentioned I'm moving, you know, that's kind of taking up my time right now and uh, just working um, and, you know, hanging out with the fam. You know, my son is uh, seven now. I guess he must have been five when we last talked and uh you know so he he takes up a lot of time so i'm just busy all the time basically just doing doing uh dad stuff i guess yeah i i'm in brooklyn which is also very expensive the neighborhood i'm in but i have kind of a special situation here where i have a really nice apartment with a lot of space that's very cheap for the area and i'm very grateful for it I'm going to stay here as long as I can. 18 years if I can, like you did, Jeff. How long have you been there now? Oh, since October of 2018, which is the longest I've lived, I think, in any place in New York City. Because there, I had to move a whole bunch of times in a small period of time because things kept going wrong. So the fact that I've been planted here for, I guess, going on four years now is makes me very happy yeah just don't don't accumulate lots of stuff i have i listen i'm gonna get into this in a little bit i'm sure everybody saw the announcement i joined the darling fire as their bass player i've got bases now cabinets equipment 
I built a whole workstation with multiple computers because I was going to be a streamer, but I'm not really doing that anymore. I've got another desk in my living room with all this tech equipment I'm not using. It's a mess over here, Jeff. Yeah, it's. It, it, but if you're there for 18 years, it's going to be brutal when you move <laughs> i mean oh, i've been doing it all month i've been doing it all month and i'm still not done i'm just gonna call one of those companies like they show up with a truck and you can i'm just gonna throw away everything yeah well that's you know i've got a bunch of garbage bags in my garage in my old spot right now so um but uh i'm trying to do it as cheaply as possible because i'm not rich so <laughs> you know exactly um but yeah so, what's your uh, what's your main go to amp then? If you're if you're doing this now, I just purchased a Ampeg SVT four ten HLF. That's the four by ten cabinet. It's like the half size of the giant fridge one that people have. You know? Right. Yeah. Easier to move. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need the giant one, and I, I don't feel like dragging that around. Sure. I've got a dark glass micro tubes five hundred head. Nice. nice. It's really small, really compact. There's all kinds of different configuration things you can do with it. I'm looking forward to setting that up. I've got a Mexican P-Base. I've got an American P-Base because we use different tunings. So I've, I've, I bought a lot of toys, Jeff, but it's very exciting. Yeah, it's always fun to get new gear. I love getting new gear. Right now, my, my gear purchases have been actual cases, which I'm excited about because um, we're going to be flying a lot this year and uh, my previous flight case was so heavy and no it had no wheels um oh. it, was, it was a anvil case and it like with the base in it probably weighed 50 pounds and you know carrying that through an airport is just like oh no forget it. how did you do it i well i didn't have a <laughs> i hurt my back last year so uh, i didn't have a back injury and i would just put it on a cart you know so but um but I got something with wheels that I'm excited about. So um, I got a SKB flight case. So excited about that. Yeah, you need that. We're getting older, Jeff. Old, old man. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a full US coming up with Jerome's dream, yes? Most US. We're not doing the West Coast yet. That's That'll happen later this year. But it's because we, you know, I have to get home to my family. Um, and my wife's like, you can't go for that long. Um so yeah, it's that it, we just had time constraints and Sean, you know, he has to work too. And, um, as much as we wanted to do full, full us, um, we just didn't, we couldn't fit it all in. So we have to pick and choose where we go and when we do it. I, uh, typically don't tip my hat to future guests, but I'm, I'm going to do it. I, I recorded an episode with Sean Leary, your new bandmate, Jeff in yeah. Jerome's dream. And of course, he's in Loma Petra as well. Could you uh, could you have me as the uh, as the guest host for that one too? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That was actually discussed, but I, I don't like to double up on band members for the same show because I feel like it's too much. I like to I like to have a contrasting thing, you know. Yeah, mix it up. yeah, yeah. No, I was just kidding. <laughs> it would be fun to have you on and to talk about Sean though, because like we could review the whole conversation right. and be like, is is this true? <laughs> is this true? Okay. <laughs> and, well, I whatever whatever you guys talked about, I'm sure it was great. I mean, Sean is the best the best guy. He really, yeah, he was super nice. And it, look forward to that one, everybody. It's going to be good. Jerome's Dream has a new record coming out, The Gray In Between, yes? Yeah. When does that come out? Uh, May 5th, I think the day is. It's uh, somewhere in that on that weekend. We have a very busy weekend that weekend, so I think it, but I think it's May 5th is the release date. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and we've got two singles out. Jeff is going to tell us the names of them because I forget them right now. Uh, the first one that we released was, is Stretched Invisible from London. And the second was um, South by Isolation. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I like them a lot. I like the band a lot. I, I was excited to have you on, Jeff, because I wanted to tell you. Did you know that I tried to rip off uh, the end riff in Do We Write to Write Write from Presents? <laughs> 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 oh, that song title still makes me laugh. <laughs> I know it, it was so hard to say. I'm I'm surprised I didn't mess it up. But I love that riff so much, and my band kind the band I'm putting together kind of sounds in the realm of Jerome's dream. So I was like, I love that riff. Let me see if I can do something like that. And I didn't manage to, 
but I did do something else that ended up being good. Oh, good. I'm glad. I mean, yeah. I yeah, I don't know what Nick was doing when when we wrote that record, but I would usually give him sort of a side side sideways look and be like, "What's wrong with you?" You know, <laughs> 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 in a in a good way, of course. But um, yeah, but that's that's cool. I'm glad you you came up with something. You know, we got to pull from from all of our influences here and there. So. Yeah, I, I, it ended up being more of like a Dillinger Escape Plan esque riff from, from a different song. But, but that, you know, I, th- that's a good way to write. I've discovered is I listen to something to draw inspiration from, but I, I make it different enough that you could never tell. You know, it's like, a, it's like a jumping off point. Yeah. I think that's a pretty common way of, of doing it. You just hear something, you're like, man, this is so good. I want to make something this good. And then you wind up with what you wind up with. Yeah. So we have the new record coming out. We've got a big tour coming up. We've got Sean in, in the band now. There's a lot of exciting things happening, right? Yeah. It's uh, it, it's nice to finally be doing what we set out to do in 2019 before the pandemic. Um, you know, the pandemic was a brick wall for everybody. And uh, it's nice that we're we're finally able to get back on the horse and get out there and share the music that we've spent the last year and a half writing with other people. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. Yeah. First new record since 2019 LP, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I talk about this a lot with people when they ask me about the record, they're like, I feel like they're being polite. They're like, Oh, that record is good. You know? And I think parts of it are, but overall I think I feel like it's more, more like a demo, the LP or, you know, LP. And uh, I feel like what the gray in between is, is what, we set out to do back then and yeah i mean i'm I'm pretty happy with it so it doesn't feel like a demo to me that's awesome and it's got to be nice having eric out in san francisco too right when you were both on the show last i can't remember if he had already moved out there or if he was planning to yeah no he was here i think he moved in july so he was fresh but yeah no he's here now um and yeah it is it's great we commute to practice together i usually pick him up and uh we practice in oakland so um so we drive over the bridge together and catch up you know we'll get dinner together it's it's nice you know like not only are we in a band together but we're we're like brothers so we spend a lot of time together i love that you know san francisco is the only other place i've wanted to live besides new york city in recent times at least sure yeah it's a You know, it's been bruised by the pandemic, I'd say. Um, You know, our downtown is kind of empty. A lot of uh, people working remotely now, it's hard for the local businesses to stay open. And, um, you know, it's sort of a domino effect. But but overall, the city's great. I mean, it's beautiful. Everybody's pretty chill. Lots of really good food. Weather's always pretty good, although this winter has been pretty brutal. But lots and lots and lots of rain. But Overall, I mean, yeah, I'm here. I moved here in 2001 and I'm still here. And now I'm here for for good with the with the new house. So, but yeah, you should move out or get a get a get a sublet and come hang out and uh you can you can commute to practice with Eric and I. Oh, I would be into that. Then I can see how to play that riff and then maybe I'll be able to rip it off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know cuz Nick's not here, so um we, we i don't think we could figure it out yeah i i didn't i i'm sure i wasn't in the right tuning i just i couldn't even get close i i bet sean could figure it out sean sean is pretty pretty masterful with a guitar so i mentioned it earlier in the show but i have joined but i have joined the darling fire on bass i'm sure some of you saw the announcement but in case you didn't I've joined the band. I went down there to practice with them last weekend with uh, the new drummer, John. We both live in Williamsburg. We drove down to Baltimore. We played with the band. It sounded great from the get-go. Uh, I'm really excited to be in the band. We're going to be playing some shows. We're playing two shows the weekend of April 15th, April 15th in Lancaster, PA, and April 16th in Virginia. I can't remember the name of the town, but check the new scene Instagram page for the flyer. If you live in Lancaster or Virginia, come check out the show. 
These will be the first live gigs I have played in quite a long time because I've been distracted with a number of different things. I was horribly addicted to drugs and had to get clean. I put together a band and we recorded an album, but the band broke up before the record came out, so we never got to play any shows. Then I was doing some acting, then there was the podcast, and then there was the pandemic. But now I'm back, Jeff, and it feels really, really good. Yeah, I mean, it's in your, it's in your soul. And if you don't get to do that, you feel like not a not a full person. And it's I'm I'm really happy for you because it's there's nothing better, there's nothing more fun, there's nothing more fulfilling than doing the things that you love. And making music is is incredible. So I'm really excited for you, and I hope that you guys get out here and do do a tour out here so I can come to the show or that we play together or cross paths in that way cuz I want to see you play. I want to see I really hope that happens. Yes. I want to see you up there and like just just getting it all out, you know, cuz it's it's the best thing. So It's going to be awesome. Yeah, and what you the way you just described it is perfect cuz I thought it I thought it was done cuz I don't know many musicians up here. I thought it was all over. I thought my days of playing in bands was done. But, you know, I just happened to go to the Darling Fire show back in January at St. Vitus. I was talking to Geronimo. He mentioned the original drummer and bass player left. I mentioned that I played bass and here we are. And look, I'll tell the whole story. Uh, when Whatever next podcast episode I record where there's not a guest co-host, I'll tell that whole story in detail. But I don't want to do it now because, you know, Jeff is here. I want to talk to Jeff about you know, stuff while I've got them here. Who does the designs for Jerome's Dream? Like I'm talking flyers and shirts and Instagram posts. I mean, it's very tasteful. You guys have very good taste and presentation. I would love to say it's me, but it's not. It's Eric. So um, so if he listens to this whole episode, he's going to feel good. He's gonna be like, oh yeah, that's me. No, yeah. <laughs> He does it all. Um, well, Sean, Sean also does some stuff too. Um, he's also got a designer's eye. And so he, he definitely um, will weigh in on stuff. But we, you know, Eric does 99% of it. And then um, if we don't like something, we'll, we'll just kind of let him know. And, and then I'll be like, but no, this is the way. <laughs> <laughs> He'll just kind of steamroll us and be like, nope, this is how it's done. And, uh, but yeah, no, I think I think he does a great job. I'm I'm happy to, that uh, that he's doing it. I'm more of like a logistical person, you know, like uh, booking vans and hotels and um, routing stuff and things like that. That's that's more more my my strength. And uh, you know, Kurt was mentioning that earlier how they all do their their thing, right? I think he, he mentioned that Ben and Nate were the logistical people. And I was like, oh yeah. That's I do that too. So I was just thinking of that. Yeah, and Jake handles all the visuals, obviously. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Eric, Eric yeah. does all the visuals and a lot of the songwriting, and um, you know, and then Sean puts his sauce on it. And uh, you know, Sean, Sean's kind of a, a jack of all trades. You know, he's he's good at the design, he's good at the writing music, and he's good at logistical things. So so it's it's good to have him in the mix, um, taking some of that weight off of both of us. Yeah, that's good. I mean, uh, well, it was three, just a three piece before, right? Yeah, it's still just a three piece. Um, Nick, Nick is not with us right now. Oh, that's right. Okay, so right. Yeah. Okay, where is he? Why? Why did he leave? We don't know where he is. Honestly, really? Yeah. Um, the I think the the pandemic sort of you know it's it's broken a lot of people. I don't know if it broke him or not, but but he he hurt himself uh, and right before we were about to record and he hurt his wrist so he couldn't play so he didn't come out for the recording and um the last time we talked to him he's like hey listen i'm i'm not going to make it out for the recording and we haven't talked to him since so um we're not sure no communication at all that's it yeah so we're just not we're not sure what's going on um you know if he if he listens to this what we miss you <laughs> you know but um but the the train keeps moving we got to keep going and uh yeah it, it's sad you know I, I i miss him he's he's our brother and um i'm sure i'm sure he'll he'll be happy to hear the music and uh how it came out but no bad blood at least on on our end um 
we don't know what we just don't know what's going on you know uh that's so odd he's he's a man of mystery and he always has been i just hope he's okay i do too i do too yeah so was the whole album done like you're ready to record it and then he's just like i can't do it i'm injured yeah yeah so what do you what do you do like how does Sean learn it? Does he come in and have to learn it all to record it? How does that work? Well, we wrote with Sean because he's here. So it was us teaching to Nick or Sean teaching to Nick. So he, w- he wouldn't have been on every song. Um, you know, Sean taught him some of the songs, and but he wasn't going to be on everything. So I think that sort of made made it a little bit easier for him to make that decision. I wish he, he would have been there. We, we wrote the whole thing with Sean um because he he lives a couple towns away and um so it was just easy for us to do and it was a natural fit i mean you talk to sean and you you realize how nice he is and what what a good guy he is but also he is a virtuoso with the guitar i mean and he'll be the first one to tell you he's not but the first time we played with him i was like this guy slides right in it's seamless you know and so and he he totally it it was easy for him to gel with the way that we write too um which is i feel is a little bit unique but you know he 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 came right in he he just he just picked it up and and started running with it and you know so uh he's he's a joy to play with and um i feel really fortunate to have him as part of the band that's awesome yeah really nice guy everyone out there you're gonna hear it eventually i don't know when but it's coming (laughs) (laughs) i'll be the first one to listen i i hope so apparently people turn off other podcasts to listen to me and you know what i love that i I gotta take credit i gotta take credit wherever i can get it jeff totally totally you have to because it's you know you're doing this for a reason, right? And it feels good when you know that you're doing a good job. I'm doing it still because I love it. I really do love it. I love getting to talk to all of my favorite musicians. That part can be stressful. I really love just sitting and piecing it all together and dropping in the musical recommendations and making the playlist. Like the whole thing I really enjoy. And that's why I still do it. Yeah. What, what made you start doing it? What was the, what was the, the impetus? There was a podcast... I listened to. I'm not going to say which one. It's not a music podcast, but it inspired me because they started out and they were so bad. Like <laughs> they they were recording into a laptop with no mic. Oh. And you you know, it was just like ridiculous, but it was good. I liked it a lot. I still like it. And you know, they got better. I was like if they can do it, I can do it. So I I had the Northeast scene Instagram going where we were just posting show videos and flyers and everything, but it was getting some traction. So I said to Tommy, if we get to 1000 followers, we're doing a podcast. And he was like, okay. And then, uh, here we are three years later. I think you mentioned that the 1000 followers last time I was on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's great. You know, I feel like you must've really loved talking to Kurt then because oh yeah he everything he was saying was inspiring i felt really yeah. you know i i when i when i shut it off i was like man you know it, it just felt really good to hear someone that was so into what he does and always trying to find a way to do new stuff and teach himself new things and and be always be a student that um i came away feeling inspired and i can't wait to get back in and start writing again because i want to take that inspiration yeah like uh episodes like kurt are special because when it's somebody that got me into this music in the first place you know cave converge quicksand those episodes are really special to me so when we can land episodes like that i'm very 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 happy yeah well you you had a good one today so i'm 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 glad that i got to be a part of it me too jeff we did it we did it <laughs> yeah i hope i didn't embarrass myself too much no listen i'm a master editor jeff by the time <laughs> i'm done with this we are going to sound like consummate professionals yeah yeah you know, you'll you'll be like so jeff well thanks for being on <laughs> <laughs> i'll just take it all out this might be the longest episode ever i'm gonna have to look and see but listen We're out of time. Yeah. We're out of time. So I want to thank Kurt again for coming on the show. And I want to thank you, Jeff, for coming on the show, because it's great to get to meet you through this. 
It's great that Jerome's dream is still making music because I really enjoy it and I'm really looking forward to the new album. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me again. Um, it, you know, it, it's an honor to be here, and uh, you know, I'm I'm just always surprised that anybody wants to talk to me. <laughs> so, um, but hey, uh, will you be will you be at our show in New York? When is it? Uh, I'd have to look. Let me look. Yeah, yeah. Let's look. Hold on. We're going to extend the show a little bit more, everybody, as we look up when Jerome's dream is playing New York, June second. That is. That's a Friday. Oh yeah, I'll go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just excellent. Just let let us know and and we'll list you. So. Oh, this is awesome. Yeah, because I am as we're like winding down, I'm thinking, oh, I need to meet Jeff somehow, and I completely forgot about the tour that's coming through my city. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to be there. Awesome. I'll be there. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get some uh, new pizza at Grim Ales too. My buddy owns grim ales we did the wind up bird together so um but he's got a new pizza spot opening in his brewery which i'm really excited about oh awesome yeah go check it out all right well that's it we're out of time so i i encourage everybody to go check out the new jerome's dream singles they are on spotify and everywhere else i'll add one to the new scene 2023 spotify playlist so i'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest So thanks, everybody, for listening, and until next time.